back to set up this uh, seminar and I'm really happy that finally, finally uh, we all are here. And for the next two days, uh, we'll have three sessions, scientific sessions, and one keynote session. And um, tomorrow after keynote session, we can uh, discuss uh, all topics. But if you have any questions uh, to speaker, you can uh, text in the chat or uh, in YouTube. And uh, if you'll have time, we'll, uh, uh, the speaker will uh, answer these questions. So, and uh, the first session, uh, I think uh, Hugh Plisson will lead this session. So 3D and CT scanning and statistical methods in uh, biological and anthropo uh, anthropological um, paleont and paleont paleontological studies. So Hugh, are you here? Yes. Hi, everybody. I am, I am glad to, to introduce this session. Uh, I must say first that uh, this session has been prepared by my colleague uh, Solange Rigaud from PASEA lab, but unfortunately the new that uh, was not convenient for her, so I, I have to replace her. And uh, first I beg your pardon from, for my very approximate English. I hope that it will uh, anyway be uh, enough understandable. So it's already 11, we have to start. And uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, my colleague from PASEA Lab, Alain Kefelec, uh, who is about to present you uh, some application of uh, confocal microscopy. Please, uh, Alain. Yeah. Let's go. Okay, I will share my screen. Is it working now? Yeah. Yes, it is visible. So okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Please uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a CNRS engineer at the Passea Laboratory in Bordeaux, and I work mainly in the field of uh, mineral characterization and uh, microscopy. In this presentation, I will uh, present the work we've been doing on different types of archaeological artifacts by using surface texture analysis by means of confocal microscopy. The aim of this kind of study is to try to extract ourselves from several biases and difficulties that are currently found in surface texture studies, which are listed here. With, with some are listed here. The, the use of quotation system is different for each study. When it's not different, it's often uh, a high variability of inter-observers quantifications. And finally, it's often uh, very difficult to go back to what causes the surface modifications on artifacts. This last point, however, uh, remains also very difficult in our studies and uh, equifinality is a problem we face like everyone else. The general methodology we use in this kind of study is relatively similar. Of course, we begin with by establishing a research question, and sometimes we think that surface textures analysis could be useful in answering this question. It is often necessary, if possible, to create a reference collection, most of the time including natural samples or experimental samples with known origin and diverse surface textures. This collection is observed at different magnification and is used to test the potential of texture analysis to separate the different region of our experiments. This test involves the measurement protocols itself with the microscope, but also the treatment of surface measurement in specific software and the choice of regosymmetric parameters. Then, if it seems that our method allows to distinguish experiments or natural provenance, we apply the same method to the archaeological artifacts. All the measurements, all the case studies I will present today have been made using this microscope, a sensor S Neox. It has a specific eye column so that we can analyze big objects. We chose a variety of objectives and we also choose to have a fully motorized system so that the measurements are quick and reliable. We also try to keep track of the many software updates despite their cost, since it is improving every year with quicker measurements, new kind of treatments and regosymmetric measurements. 
I will not present today the way the microscope works and will only begin at the step where we have finished the 3D surface measurement. Just think of it like a Z stacking of very well focused images and reconstruction of the final image with known Z level for each pixel of the image. On the 3D measurement, several treatments are necessary to obtain the final surface, which are represented here. We first need to level the surface, then to remove outliers that can occur during the measurement, and then we fill the non-measure points by filling the voids with a specific algorithm. This treatment allows for obtaining a surface on which we can calculate many rugosymmetric parameters derived from an ISO norm used in the industry. These values are describing different parameters of the surface, as you can see here, such as the mean roughness, the shape of the peaks, the proportion of peaks versus holes, etc. Another kind of parameters using fractals are also used, and you will hear a bit more about it in the presentation of Antoine Souvon later on. Now the main part of the presentation, it will be several case studies to show you what we've been doing with this method in the recent years. I will begin with flint taphonomy, then I will present a study on solitary and lustered gravels, one for study connected to occur use, since Daniela Rosso will present the other study of occur use uh, lately. Finally, I will quickly present the results obtained on the different surfaces of a single artifact that we made to understand the taphonomic history, a specific object from the Tolbar archaeological site. This study of flint taphonomy has been one of the very first we began with since some, some colleagues immediately saw the potential of this technique in the very first demonstration of the microscope years before we managed to buy it. This work was divided in two imbricated studies, one mainly focused on the understanding of the white patina, one on a specific archaeological case study. As for the white patina, it began with the well-known observation of differential patina on different flints in a single archaeological site. For example, you have here on the left a nice refitting of several flint blades on a single core, which show very different patina, even if they've been found a few meters away in the same archaeological site. On the right, you can see the microphotos of the surface of these artifacts showing the development of the white patina. To understand the process, Solenko began an experiment in the laboratory with different raw materials. These flints were put in different chemicals and heated to accelerate the process and then extracted from the oven after different numbers of days. You can see here the results of the two examples after respectively nine and five days in sodium hydroxide, best known as soda, a very well developed white patina. Here we can see that both basic solutions, potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide, create the white patina, while acid solutions like hydrochloric acid changes the color of the flint by dissolving the iron oxides it contains, but do not create the white patina. And of course, distilled water did not do anything to the flint. The white color of the artifacts measured with a spectrometer shows a quick raise of the luminance value here the L star, while the luminance raises, the other metric parameters not shown here remain constant, meaning that the color seen by the spectrometer on the contrary of our eyes does not really differ. This raise in the luminance is connected directly to the appearance of, uh, of porosity on the, on, on, the, on the flints. And in fact, it is connected directly to the diffusion of light in this newly created porosity. We can see on the confocal images and on the profiles, the size of the holes that were created by the chemical dissolution. We can see here, especially on the right, that the rigosymmetric measurements allows for quantification of this taphonomical process and can therefore be used to quantify the patina and compare on solid basis different sites, different raw materials, etc. 
We applied the same methodology to study the archaeological site of Saint-Césaire, which is a site well known to have in some layers, very different on the flint artifacts. As you can see on the right, we first tried on objects showing on different scars, very different microscopic surfaces. This discriminant analysis shows that the method performs well at separating these visibly different aspects. We then applied the methodology to two different raw materials collected in different natural environments around the archaeological site to understand the variability of surface textures. We can see here that both raw materials show approximately the same kind of surface texture. We then applied the same protocol to archaeological artifacts and tried to understand if the method could lead to the same kind of results than surface observation by naked eye. It worked quite well as the previous study showed. And we can differentiate white patina, lustrous, and uh, uh, with the red points as being the, the experimental chips, so the non-patinated non and non lustered uh, uh, objects. Finally, we compared all the archaeological artifacts coming from a single two centimeters pass of a single subsquare of the site and discovered that these artifacts show even greater variability of surface texture than the World Geological Reference Collection. This result on an archaeological site we knew was showing stratigraphic problems, confirmed the potential of the method, and we would like now to use it on other archaeological sites to explore further the ways it, would, it could help archaeologists to better understand the integrity of their layers, for example. Let's talk now a bit about luster gravels in solitary sites, which is a work led by this. Here are the pictures of, the, of these gravels found in several archaeological sites in the southwest of France and recently in the open air site of Landry. The question here are the anthropogenic origin of these artifacts and, if confirmed, the potential use of these objects. In this presentation, I will only focus on the surface texture analysis we conducted, but the work also con contains other studies. As you can see here, we measure with the same protocol beach gravels, gravels from the opener site with no connection to the archaeological layers, and gravels from different archaeological sites. The gravels from archaeological sites clearly show higher polish with lower values of roughness parameters SQ and SDR. That is explained by a tighter distribution of the aids. With these box plots, we can clearly see that the archaeological sites in caves are more lustered than the natural ones and that the laundry gravels made of quartz are intermediate in this pattern, probably because quartz is harder than the raw materials found in the cave sites. The experiments conducted show that it is indeed possible to lower the roughness values of quartz gravels by, by several processes, with the experiment on tumbling with occurred skin being the more conclusive as compared with the archaeological artifacts. Nevertheless, it is of course very difficult to be sure of the exact process that conducted these gravels to be that polished, as many processes could lead to the formation of this same surface texture. Concerning the use of ochre in the Middle Stone Age, you will have later on a presentation by Daniel Arosso, who will present the work we did on the Porky Peak site. So I will only shortly present the study of a drowned flake of silkrete in the Blombos Cave who proved to be the oldest drawing discovered so far. Our goal was here to demonstrate that, as we thought it was by naked eye observation, the surface on which the drawing was made was not a natural surface of the artifact. As you can see here on the photogrammetic model on the, of the artifact, this surface is indeed quite concave and quite smooth. We measured different points on the different sides of the artifacts to compare the drowned surface with the other surfaces of the, of the silk thread. 
this study allowed us to demonstrate that the painted surface was indeed significantly smoother than the other surfaces of the artifact. As you can see on the left in red points and box plots with ISO parameters. On the right, you can see the fractal time measurements showing also in red that with different mathematics, the surfaces were indeed very different. This smooth surface could have been or even prepared for the drawing by the inhabitants of the Blombos cave more than 70,000 years ago. I will finish this presentation with a study led by Solange Rigaud on a site some of you probably know way better than me. The pendant found in Tolbor site, which is interpreted as being a sexual representation, shows different surface textures. We quantified these textures and showed that they were indeed very different on a rigosymmetric point of view, helping us to explain the taphonomy of this artifact. You can read more about it soon in the upcoming paper. And that's it. I hope I gave you the will to embrace this kind of study for your own questions and surface textures. And I thank you for your attention. If you, if you wish to participate in a new open way to publish your work, do not hesitate to visit the Peer Community in website. Uh, thank you, Anna. Very interesting uh, lecture, uh, which shows that uh, confocal microscopy is about to, to become a standard, uh, not only in uh, traceology, but uh, more generally in archaeology, at least prehistoric archaeology. So uh, I don't know how the session works, if uh, there is time now for questions or if we continue with the lectures. Ar Arena, could you tell me, or Xenia? No, uh, I think we have time for questions. Yes, we have okay, time. Okay, so if, if uh, anybody has a question. Alan, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, and uh, how much time uh, does it take to uh, study how to work with confocal microscope for the non-specialist, for example, for the archaeologist? Yeah, it, it, this is one, one of the problems. It, it can be quite long because, of course, you have to, to make the measurements on the reference collection and after on the archaeological collection. And uh, I think that's uh, one of the one of the one of the problems that makes that uh, since we made the first studies and uh, everything, uh, since then we we did not uh, manage to to have enough time to to make it uh, on other archaeological sites. So this is a problem. Clearly, it improves with time because the the microscopes are measuring faster and faster. And also the, the calculation of the parameters can take some time, especially for the fractal analysis. But uh, uh, as always, the, the computers are calculating uh, quicker and quicker. So, so we, are, we are clearly in, uh, uh, earning time uh, for the calculation. And with the microscope, it, it takes time. Uh, it's quite easy to use. So it's easy to learn how to use it. It takes half a day to use it correctly. But uh, after you have to, to spend time uh, as you have to, to do on with every archaeological study. <laughs> it seems to me that it's simple to study, but it's quite expensive <laughs> yeah. <the> equipment. <laughs> yeah, it's quite expensive. The, the price of the microscope is uh, between uh, 100 and 150,000 euros. Yeah, it's uh, the same price as uh, several P PhD students. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it, it helps in publishing, and then you can get a lot of money if you have a papers in uh, high uh, journals. So it can be a good investment. Yeah. Is there another question? I have a question. Hello, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, I understand that you have a sort of a procedure that you developed in, to analyze the surface. Do you have it in a code that others could use? Is it translated into some sort of a closed package that uh, we could use? Uh, no, in, in fact, the, um, the software we use to make uh, the calculations after the measurement is a proprietary solution. 
and uh, it's part of the expensive price of the machine because the software itself is uh, 15,000 euros. It's a, it's a software that uh, is called uh, Mountains Map, and uh, you, you can find it in, um, in, with almost all of the microscope, uh, confocal microscope. It's the same, the same software. It ends with map at the end. If it's a Leica microscope, it's Leica map. Sensofar makes Senso map. But if you have map at the end, probably it's Mountains Map at, at the basis of the software. And this is a software made in France. Cocorico, but uh, but it's very expensive, yeah. Uh, and this is making all the calculations. And after we just use a R or any software to make box plots and, and B plots. But ah, so there's no additional developments that were made specifically for this question. No, no, no. We we use the uh, ISO parameters, which are used every day by all industry, and also the fractal uh, analysis which were uh, a few years ago, it was a specific uh, software and now it is incorporated in the Mountains uh, program. Thank you. Any other question? No? So uh, now we are going uh, uh, to Dordogne uh, in a rock shelter with uh, Laurent Lescope from uh, Enza School of Architecture in Nantes. Uh, is uh, presenting uh, one aspect of a collective project. Please, Laurent. No sound. Micro. Microphone, please. Okay, <laughs> I, I, no, I had a problem. There was a lag between the, uh, the message that I had and uh, the um, um, uh, what I saw on screen. Uh, so thank you very much. I will share uh, and start the presentation. Yes. Um, so yes, it's part of a study and I will present just an aspect which is a very technical aspect of um, the survey of the fish shelter. Um, so just to remind, uh, I will not give a lot of historical background, but uh, just remember that the fish shelter was found and excavated by Paul Giraud and uh, Elie Massena in 1892. And uh, then they named the location How Pit B and discovered an um, Orenician level beneath one and a half meter, meter of gravel. And uh, then excavations and blood examinations for possible decoration were not, not done at that time. And uh, Francois or Gabriel Gallou uh, discovered fires, uh, spit-based tips, punches, pierce teeth, and a musk skull in uh, 18, um, um, 1898. But it wasn't until 1912 that Jean-Maurice Marsan discovered the famous fish. It is a Beccard salmon. While he was sleeping on his back in the shelter and then gave the shelter the, the current name of the fish shelter. Um, this uh, sculpture of the salmon is so unique that it quickly picked people on interest and prompted furry visits. And you know, there was, there was uh, the story of uh, the German um, Karl Schwab who wanted to um, save the fish. And then uh, the removal of the figure began in late 1912 until Didier Peroni became aware of it and uh, uh, ordered the operation to be stopped immediately. Uh, the fish is finally protected, but the stigma has come to define it, a punch out frame in 1913, the shelter was classified. So in grazing light, uh, the fish figure is, is relatively visible, but the traces and signs that accompany are much more difficult to perceive and interpret. Uh, there have been a few scientific interventions between um, Abbe Breuil 
uh, so based in 1913 and today. The only exception is the technical study of engraving and sculptures on the ceiling conducted by uh, the couple Dalek in 1983. Uh, so just a map with the location, so we can see the distance between Novosibirsk and Poisson. It's the, in between Bordeaux and Toulouse, and close to the AZ. Uh, so um, a study conducted in September 2016 uh, uh, as part of the scientific agreement with the University of Novosibirsk established a high potential of techno traceological information on the ceiling, as well as the ability to distinguish between anthropogenic parts and subsequent alteration. In fact, new representation are even possible to consider. Um, the team created a precise photogrammetric survey of the entire site as well as an extremely accurate survey of the Poisson figure, of the fish figure. The model obtained has infra-millimetric resolution and the 3D model is over 90 million polygons. So to test our tools, we adapted the resolution of the 3D mesh and uh, at high resolution, we did a topography, a topography of, the, of the fish figure. Then we tested the deviance map <clears throat> the way we did before. We used deviance map for the first time years ago on Gavrinis to explore the engraving, the very thin engravings of uh, Gavrinis. But the tool we had were not flexible enough. So we decided to develop our own tool using photogrammetric tools. Uh, for that, we use Rhino and Grasshopper. Rhino is a very interesting software. It's not very expensive, and Grasshopper is free. It's very much used in the uh, uh, architecture industry and um, in uh, design. Uh, it gives the, the possibility to develop the, your, your own tools. And for that uh, survey, uh, it, uh, that's what has been done. So the process is quite easy and very fast to learn. First, uh, uh, you just import the three D mesh, and then, uh, so to do this Davian map, it was just a, a question of the calculation of the centroid of um, each um, each polygons to have the x y z coordinates, and then uh, the values are sorted to have the extreme, um, so the highest and the lowest, and then to put a color depending on heights. So the total definition, as you can see, is very light. It's very easy to, uh, uh, to conceive. And you can even design lighter definition. That's what I've done uh, after that. So by exploring depth, you see, you just have to move sliders. And then you can explore differences um, by the game of colors. So you can do it in real time with a fast computer. And it really enlightens fine details that are very hard to see. You can even change the gradient. And sometimes in black and white, it's even easier to, to reveal some fine details. And this is also very easy to do. So as you can see, you can zoom in and uh, by uh, just moving the sliders. So the sliders, you've got the extreme height uh, and it's uh, the highest points and lowest points. But you can also decide to just have a window because you can have on the surface extreme peaks. And then you, want, you, you don't want them to interfere in the calculation. So you can just refer to a very thin um, uh, part of the model. But the idea after that was to say, OK, uh, we very often see the deviance map, map uh, defined from eight. And the idea was to change it and to see what we could have if 
we could calculate slopes and the angle of slopes. Uh, so you, you see on this graphic the difference between the two. Uh, on the left, you have the deviance map and then the calculations uh, in terms of height. And then the calculations on the right uh, drawing, uh, depending on slopes. And slopes could be um, given very different details. And so that's what we are going to explore. Uh, so the definition for that is a bit more complicated, but not that much. It starts uh, the same way with the import uh, importation of the um, of the surface of the uh, of the mesh. Then we calculate the uh, centroid to have um, uh, to create then a line which is perpendicular to the uh, center of of the face, and that this line is pointing out several directions and the idea is to compare uh, this direction with a specific angle that we choose before for instance z and but it can be x y and then we start to see what kind of results we got and we saw that we really have new details that are revealed by the uh, calculations of angles uh, for instance in in that drawing you can see um, the differences between the uh, vector z so pointing up and then the calculation made with uh, vector x, uh, so it's horizontal on, on the right. And uh, it's really revealing the details that were before very hard to see. Um, and uh, the idea is also to point x, uh, y, to, uh, to save the differences. And then um, you can uh, just uh, change the definition to see if you can point to any direction. And it could be interesting also to, to have the choice to move to any directions and then really to have a lot of possibilities of explorations. Um, so this is uh, what is done here. So you see the differences between several angles and what it reveals. Again, the game of colors, um, uh, it can be changed. And also you can filter the angles, uh, for instance, if you've got extreme slopes, maybe you don't want to see them. If you want to see very fine details on some areas, so you can zoom on some areas and then choose the um, uh, the, uh, the angles that you want to explore, and then it reveals uh, the details. Uh, so this is in real time what it gets. You know, like with filtering, this is just uh, filtering angles there. What is very interesting in, in that is you really build the, the tool that you need and you add the functions that you, you need to explore. And then you can really change in real time. You need a computer to change in real time as uh, this very high definition. For this shape that you see on screen, they have, they, there are um, 700,000 polygons. That's quite a lot. Um, so maybe the next step would be to explore with the highest definition that you can get from the model. This is a zoom. And again, explorations. So again, the best result would be on the on the highest definition uh, three that you can get. And this is so the uh, uh, the question is to have. A powerful enough computer to have it nearly real time. Uh, but I mean, with the lightest computers, it's now possible. And this is how you can change vectors. You can see it's quite straightforward. So this is, you need uh, Z, Y, Z, but it just, yeah. And then again, find details to be revealed.
So I recorded this, but I can demonstrate it in real time. And then uh, again, uh, so as it is a visual exploration, uh, sometimes it's easier to change, uh, for instance, the color. And in black and white and gray, uh, it's very nice to see a lot of details appearing. So uh, we did this method. New details were uh, detected by uh, archaeologists, my two fellow archaeologists, uh, Catherine Cotin and Lydia. And we um, uh, and they saw fine details that were not visible uh, before. And so the, the next step now would, would be to get back in on site to verify that what is seen on the computer is also seen um, in reality. But uh, you see uh, the differences uh, in terms of orientation, Z, X, Y, you've got a really different figure and it really enlights um, details uh, differently and, very, and it's, it's very fine, so it's, it's very interesting. Uh, so thank you, I can... Uh, I can say it's not very complicated to, to set up um, and it's very easy to share. It's not expensive as the software has got uh, an academic version, which is not expensive. And the Grasshopper, I mean, the parametric part of the software is free. Uh, so this is what we also are looking for to make some um, economy on, on, on projects. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent, for this uh, very technical uh, report. Uh, I think that it uh, will give uh, ideas to students and to colleagues who are involved in uh, 3D imaging. So uh, is, there a, is there any question about the technical aspect or about the site or about the project? Uh, I've got a question yes? uh, about the, um, the methodology for the calculation of slope. And uh, I, I didn't understand how the, the orientation is calculated because uh, you, you talked about the, the orientation, the angle on the X, Y, and Z axis. And uh, how, was, uh, how was that defined, this uh, free axis? Uh, it's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, the methodology of exploring the engraving with the, uh, the grazing light. Uh, but can be by hand. The idea was to mimic it. And, and, and uh, so uh, there's, um, in fact, you've got a vector uh, pointing out from each polygon. And the idea so, was, is to compare this vector to uh, one, another angle, uh, in fact. And uh, at first, at the beginning, I was just comparing with the Z angle uh, because I was, you know, on the way to define mm -hmm. it. I was coming from the eight. So I said, okay, uh, first I calculated the, the eight and I could uh, really uh, do whatever I wanted with this calculation from any points or in any shape. And then from the eight, I said, okay, then I will compare the slope, the angle with the um, uh, vertical vector. And then I said, maybe I can try not only the vertical, but also a horizontal pointed to another direction. And then I saw that I had new details revealed. And then mm -hmm. I said, okay, maybe I can, uh, uh, I can test with any uh, direction. So I'm just comparing angles and that way I, I got new, new details revealed. Yeah, just uh, I didn't understand because you, you define the vertical vector the, by the, how did you define this, this free these three uh, vectors. Uh, the technical way or just 
the uh, conceptual way. How, how did you define which was the, the Z, which was the X, and which was the, the, the Y? Uh, yeah, this, uh, this is my choice. Maybe I can share the uh, definition. It's going to be easier to. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just going to. I hope it will work. Uh, if you can let in uh, the second computer. Okay. So, um, this is what I call definition. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, the uh, this is all my polygons, and then uh, so I extract informations from uh, from this, and I will find uh, uh, the point, the face, uh, and so on. And then uh, I compare the, the vector for pointing out from the surface, which is perpendicular. Mm -hmm. It is perpendicular yes. from the surface. And then I, it's, it's my decision to, to make it, uh, to make the comparison with the uh, x, y. Okay, okay, That's okay, and I understand, thank you. And Congratulations. I, I just plug. And then you see just by plugging like that, uh, I see the differences. Uh, and then mm -hmm. I, I know the extremes. So the, you know, the extremes angles. Yes. I, I've got uh, the calculations of it and I can decide not to have all, all of them in the calculation, but filter them. Mm -hmm. You see. And by filtering the, this way, uh, sometimes uh, because uh, I've got very extreme slopes on, on that file, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's very flat. Uh, so by fil filtering, I can choose between the, the <laughs> flat uh, or if I want to explore uh, some some details that are. Yeah. Here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It was very interesting. And I can change it. Thank you. What is interesting is to test and explore. As uh, you see, the components that I use are just a few. And then it's easy to, to tweak and really to build your own tool. And, uh, and search uh, and explore with your own tool. And then you can extract data like uh, the most uh, the most angles that, that you have or any kind of data you can extract from. Thanks. Other question? So, no, uh, let's follow uh, Neanderthal from Europe to uh, Siberia with uh, Aliza Zubova, Vyacheslav Masayev, Alexander Kulkov, and Ksenia Kolobova. Please, Alisa. Hello, dear colleagues. And let me start and introduce our presentation, which will address to one of the issues of population history of the mycocaean groups, which were widespread across Eurasia in Middle Paleolithic. Uh, now we start our presentation. Uh, 
and uh, my cochlear groups, uh, as, I, as, as, I, as I already told, were widespread across Eurasia in the middle Paleolithic. They have specific non levoloas technocomplex, which were based predominantly on flake core reduction, specific plano convex method of bifacial tools production, and toolkits dominated by symmetrical bifacial tools. Initially, Mikokian sites were described mostly in Europe, where the two main clusters were recognized. The first one includes Central Europe, Germany, Poland, Poland Hungary, Northeastern France territories, and the second one was located in Eastern Europe. But uh, recent archaeological find, finds demonstrated that the lithic industries of several Altai Middle Paleolithic sites are closely related to Eastern European Mikokians. This finds uh, uh, this finds supports suggestion about the transcontinental migration, migration of Eastern Europe, European Mikokians from Eastern Europe to Siberia. And this suggestion was also supported by paleogenetic data, which reveals that late Altai Neanderthals shares more derived alleles with later Neanderthals in the populace and in Europe than with the earlier Altai Neanderthals. This study outlined the general points of mycokian dispersal across northern Eurasia, but the exact migration ways still stay unclear. And uh, the reconstruction requires uh, detailed ana analysis of the population history of Eastern, Middle Paleolithic, Eastern European Middle Paleolithic groups based on as many human fossils as it is possible. Most of such fossils still stay beyond the genetic analysis, so we started the project aimed to reconstruction of biological affinities of Eastern European and Siberian mycokians based on dental data. data. And here we present the first results of this project concerning the taxonomical attribution and comparative analysis of biological affinities of the only middle Paleolithic anthropological find from the north of Sea region. This is the upper second molar rajok the one. Uh, this is a permanent tooth of an adult individual aged 20, 25 years and found in 1961 at the Mycokian site of Rajok 1. That is the biggest middle Paleolithic site of the Taganrog Gulf. Uh, it was discovered in 1961 by Nikolai Praslov, and the main excavation was undertaken also in 1961-1962. Six cultural horizons were discovered there, and now all of them were classified as mycokian. The tooth was found in the fourth horizon, radiocarbon dating of which is ambiguous, and indicates that the site predates 40,000 years BP, but maybe so slightly older. And since the discovery of the tooth, it had been studied several times by the dental anthropologist. But the analysis of the outer enamel surface couldn't reveal clear attribution of its special taxonomic position. And the probability of the molars belonging to Homo sapiens couldn't be excluded because it's not key tooth for species determination. And uh, so it wasn't involved in the, in the investigations of the Neanderthal population history. And now we return to the problem of taxonomic attribution of uh, population affinities of the Rajok molar using digital method of analysis. Uh, we did uh, micro CT scanning of this find in the center of for X ray diffraction studies of St. Petersburg State University. And this allows to analyze the enamel junction morphology and uh, dental tissue proportions, which is currently acknowledged as a reliable criteria for differentiation between Neanderthals and modern Homo sapiens. Here on, on the slide, uh, we can see reconstruction of enamel routine junction and uh, the, the slices for preparing, the, to, to preparing for dental tissue measurements and uh, changes uh, ob object of inter ob objects of, for, for raw measurements and the, then for calculating index of dental tissue proportions. Uh, enamel, and en enamel and dentine were virtually separated and the visualization of uh, its digitized model was carried out using CTVox program, uh, using CTVox program. On the, on the model, we scored score derived 
uh, Neanderthal dental, dental non-metric traits. Uh, and, uh, sorry, we can return back. Uh, and uh, most of most of them most of most of them were found on the crystal surface of Rajoka Dean Muller. Here we can see uh, centrally placed dentin horn tips of three main cusps of the molar, and um, crystal oblique the crest which connected the tops of protocon and paracon, and um, uh, it definitely has type 2, more common for Neanderthals than for, than for Homo sapiens. It was found in 75 persons of the Neanderthal upper second molars and only in 25 of modern, modern, modern human. And here uh, we can see also medium sized post paracontin tubercle, which is also one of the derived Neanderthal traits. Um, uh, which uh, was noted in 14, 19 persons of Neanderthal tools and only in four, four persons of, of Homo, Homo sapiens tools. So the non-metric features of phenomenal dentine junction in our case uh, put the rajok within Neander Neanderthal species. On the next stage of the analysis, uh, we measured, measured volumetric characteristics of the dentine and enamel and of the whole crown and its only lateral part, and calculated several indexes uh, conventionally used for Neanderthal and modern human differentiations. The traits are listed on the slide, and um, as we can see is a table of uh, values of that, that score uh, under the results of our analysis. Uh, most of, most of the traits, um, differences in most of the traits are less with Neanderthals than with Homo sapiens. And in six, six, for six traits, that score values are close to one or exceed this rate. So it, it means uh, that uh, Rajok is on the edge of or outside the limit of 95% of Homo sapiens variability and definitely is within Neanderthal species. Then for more precise analysis, we subjected values of measured and calculated in, measured traits and calculated in, indexes of two principal component analysis. This result so this results also are presented in slide. And here we can see that it doesn't matter what, what kind of traits, which block of traits, whole crown or lateral, lateral part of crown, uh, row in row traits or calculated in, indexes. Um, we use uh, the results uh, are very similar. Rajok uh, everywhere are in the vision of Neanderthal variability and uh, very, very far from, from modern Homo sapiens. And not modern, also upper Paleolithic, but it's definitely not Homo sapiens here. So the results of both the morphological and statistical analysis confirms Neanderthal affinities of the tooth, and it allows us to compare it with other mycocian and non-mycocian Neanderthal upper second molar. But regrettably, we couldn't do this using dental tissue proportion because of the limited size of the database. The capacities of the traits for revealing the population structure within the species are still unclear, so the, the traits can, cannot be used. At the, at the moment, the, the only way to analyze the interspecies position of any two, any any dental finds, uh, we can only using dental occlusal, occlusal surface uh, mesodistal and buccolingual diameters. And now we can see the behavioral plot of these two sizes, which compared uh, Rajok Adin and Chigirska Neanderthals with other European finds, uh, which, uh, which we will get from open database, databases. Um, as, as, as we can see on the plot, uh, Rajok fall within the variabilities of Asian or Near East, Near Eastern Neanderthals, and uh, all of these samples are far from Western European, Western European Neanderthals and from Krapina. 
Here is Rajok Adin, uh, three Chigirska cave samples, two, and uh, one tooth from Steinia cave from Poland, which also belong, which also attributed as Eastern Macaukian sample. And uh, all of these uh, finds showed uh, clear specificity and uh, very low values of both, di both diameters. The, this, they are quite less than other Neanderthals, and uh, it combined it in one um, part of the plot. Uh, two Western Mycocians from Neanderthal side are here and very far from Eastern Mycocians. In our point of view, this reveal a possible biological affinities between all Eastern European and Asian Mycocians. Uh, Different absurd differentiation coincides well with geographic distribution distribution of the sites, and uh, the um, and uh, we can uh, we can <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And we, we can see that uh, all of the samples can be uh, connected with common origin. But uh, in, there are some questions about uh, the environment, uh, the, influence, the influences of environment fa factors on the permanent sizes. But uh, because we, we see very clear differentiation, uh, it can it can possible to decide that Eastern Mikokin was uh, connected with biological, biological affinities, not only common environmental conditions. And in some, in some we can make several conclusions. That at first, that the enamel dentin junction morphology and dental tissue proportions of Rajok Muller uh, analyzed using micro CT digital models revealed Neanderthal attribution of this, of this sample. The second one is that the result of the analysis of the crown diameters uh, reveal strong similarity between Eastern European Mycocians from Rajok and Steinia cave and Siberian Mycocians from Chigirska cave. And so that the transcontinental migra migration of Eastern Mycocians from the Europe to Siberia is now can be confirmed not only by genetic and archaeological data, but also with dental anthropological evidence, which um, which shows that the north of sea region can be one of the transit points on the way of, the, of, the, of this migration. Uh, thank you for the attention. We have a very, very short presentation. Thank you very much for this uh, contribution to a very fundamental question uh, of the relation between uh, cultural and biological expansion during middle periodic a very important topic. Any question? About the analysis, the technical aspect, or about the topic, uh, no relation between uh, Neanderthal groups, traditions, Mikokian? No. Uh, may I make some, uh, how to say, uh, may I tell some? to use some details about our investigations uh, with uh, Alisa and our plans. So now at uh, Chigurskaya cave, I think we have around 30, this, I guess. Uh, Alisa, am, am I right? How many teas do we have at Chigurskaya? Oh, I think more than 20, but I can, can tell you exact number <laughs> now, <laughs> because one of yeah. is not, not, not correct. Not really two, but <laughs> there is some, it depends. Yeah, so we, we, we have quite numerous uh, collection of the two, yes. and it's, it's uh, quite, uh, uh, how to say, strong uh, uh, evidence uh, for the migration and for the uh, Neanderthal dispersal to Altai. Uh, uh, 
especially if you'll take an account that Altai wasn't the final uh, place of the migration. We have only one piece of the puzzle of the um, some, some kind of uh, huge uh, Neanderthal dispersal to the east, and maybe they were somewhere further. Uh, so uh, the, the numerous uh, anthropological assemblage will, uh, so <clears throat> uh, 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 this numerous anthropological assemblage we will, uh, that we will study, we will continue our investigations. And uh, I think it will be really great uh, when anthropological uh, evidences uh, will join to the genetic evidence. Uh, you know that uh, now all of the customers, all of the researchers and uh, are very, uh, how to say, happy with genetic, but sometimes archaeology and anthropology do not go together. Uh, so, and I'm happy that uh, we have such results, uh, the only first results uh, on our uh, long way uh, that archaeology uh, as, uh, uh, together with anthropology could be also, um, how to say, uh, 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 the improvement uh, at the same level as genetics uh, uh, when we are trying to prove uh, migrations, dispersals, and uh, different uh, features of the behavior of ancient hominins. Thank you. Thank you, Ksenia. Anybody else? No, let's go to Ethiopia, uh, Middle Standard, uh, with uh, Daniela Rosso, Francesco Derico, and Alain Kefelek. Please. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, fine. Okay, so I just share my screen. Is it okay? Okay. It looks like no. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. No. No? No. Oh. no. no, no. You don't see your screen, unfortunately. Really? Oh. It is still the the screen from the previous. Uh... Yes, um, Alisa, can you stop to share your screen, please? Mm. Thank you. So. Yes, now we see. You. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so I'm starting. So, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, you I would like to thank presentation mode. Maybe change it to the other screen. Switch. Oh, sorry. Now is it okay? Yeah, full screen. Yes. Uh, yeah, just uh, make no. a screen, this, this is not the full screen view. Now it should be fine, right? No, we no, have you two have screen, to switch. One small, one small and one. Uh, Oh, I how do I, oh God, I'm sorry. <laughs> how do, how can I change this? I wish it, Go to no. the, this is even worse. To parameter affichage. And switch <laughs> screens. Exactly, basculer, yeah. Okay, is this That's fine? fine. Oh, yep. thank you, <laughs> sorry. So um, thank you to the organizers of, uh, to invite me to this workshop. So today I'm going to talk about confocal microscopy and surface analysis and how it can be used to analyze archaeological ochre. So more specifically, I'm going to present work that has been carried out by myself, Francesco De Rico and Alain Cefilec on the archaeological collection of Porcupine Cave. So first of all, I would like to give a little introduction on the theoretical framework uh, of ochre studies. So as you already know, one of the most debated questions in prehistory has been the origin of complex behavior. And more specifically, when and how human populations acquired the cognitive features that characterize our species. So different scenarios were proposed to explain the emergence of complex behavior. And in order to test these models, researchers tried to find proof for complex behavior in the archaeological context. So it is generally accepted that the capacity to create symbolic systems and incorporate them to a material culture represents proof for complex cognition. Symbolic thinking can be interpreted or detected archaeologically by the presence of different material features, for example, burials, personal ornaments, or art. Systematic exploitation of pigments is also among these features. 
color, even nowadays, plays an essential role in our perception of the world and also in the transmission of information. However, its interpretation in an archaeological context is still controversial. Some researchers support the symbolic interpretation, while others tend to demonstrate uses for other utilitarian purposes, such as hafting, high tanning, or also for protection against the sun or insects. The most common type of mineral pigment found in Paleolithic context is ochre. So by ochre, we refer to a variety of rocks characterized by red or yellow colors, containing a very high proportion of iron oxides. Yellow ochres usually derive their color from goethite, while red ochres derive their color from hematite generally, and often contain other elements, uh, other components such as quartz, clays, or even feldspars. Ochre can be found in different forms in an archaeological site, from modified or unmodified rocks uh, to residues on different types of tools or objects, such as personal ornaments, lithics, etc. And also it can be found in the form of painted art, in the form of sediment impregnations. But here we will focus more specifically on ochre in the form of rocks and lumps. So the earliest possible evidence for ochre use was found in levels dated between 1 million years and 300,000 years ago in different sites in Africa and Europe. Um, in Europe, Neanderthals use ochre well before the arrival of Homo sapiens in sites such as Maastricht's Belvedere or Terra Mata, for example. However, most of the data we have uh, comes from the African continent. Secure evidence was found in sites such as Olorgesaili or Vanderwerk around 300,000 years ago. From 100,000 years ago, the use of ochre becomes widespread in the African continent, but well-documented sites are mostly present in South Africa, in super famous sites such as Blombo, Sibudu or Pinnacle Point, for instance. Uh, in East Africa, although ochre was found in numerous sites, there is very little information on how it was used. And Porkepi Cave is one of the rare sites where ochre is studied systematically in the Horn of Africa. So the object of our work is to study the use of ochre in Porkepi Cave, which is a key site from the Middle Stone Age of the Horn of Africa. Our aim is to reconstruct the different phases of the ochre chenobatoire, to understand what may have been the function of this material. And in this presentation, we will focus more specifically on how we use surface analysis and 3D technology to study the use of ochre in this Middle Stone Age site. Bokepi Cave is a Paleolithic site situated three kilometers south of Diradawa in Ethiopia. Uh, it opens at the base of a Jurassic limestone cliff, as you can see. Um, the cave was discovered in the 30s by Henri de Montfray dans Théard de Chardin, and uh, different excavations were conducted in the 70s. Here you can see the areas that were excavated, and the collection we study comes from uh, the area in orange, which is the largest excavation that was conducted at the site. So as you can see, the deposit features a succession of sandy, clayish levels and breccia. And according to Clark and Williamson, the MSA layers are present between 60 and 230 centimeters of depth. Um, radiocarbon ages from gastropod opercula uh, were dated and range from the infinite to approximately 40,000 years BP in calibrated ages. The ochre collection at Porcupi Caves include more than 4,000 ochre pieces, 21 ochre processing tools and two ochre stain artifacts that are curated at the National Museum of Addis Ababa. Here we will focus on the ochre piece collection, obviously. So as you can see in this table, uh, to analyze this assemblage, we have tried to combine classic archaeological methods, such as, for example, spatial analysis and technologi technological studies, with a more experimental ap approach that includes surface analysis, which is the aim of this presentation. And we also conducted a granulometric analysis and we characterize the elemental and mineralogical composition of these ochre pieces. But we will only briefly mention these results. Anthropogenic modifications on ochre pieces were identified macro and microscopically. We recorded traces of flaking, striations, facets, smoothed areas, incisions, and also pits. 
In our surface texture analysis, we paid particular attention to striations that you can see on the upper right corner of the photo. So striations are produced by grinding the piece against an abrasive surface, such as, for, for example, a lower grindstone. Um, they are present as linear par parallel marks that are arranged in groups. And additionally, grinding produces facets, which are areas that are flattened by grinding and covered with striations. We reproduced striations by grinding experimentally three ochre pieces found in the surroundings of the cave on three different grindstones. So the three experimental pieces that you can see on the lower left side of the slide are comparable to the ochre types that we found at the site. One is made of a soft clayish fine grain raw material and the other two are a little, are a little bit harder and contain um, compo more components such as quartz or feldspars. Grindstones, on the other hand, were made of sandstone, quartzite, and limestone, as you can see on the photo on the right. Different surface textures um, result from grinding. This is the case with facets created with grinding ochre pieces on grindstones. Confocal microscopy allowed the surface topography of both experimental pieces and archaeological facets to be quantitatively compared in order to explore whether the type of grindstone used to produce striations can be identified. Roughness analysis was conducted with a sensor confocal microscope, which is the one that Alain Kefelec presented a few minutes ago. Um, so we conducted roughness analysis on facets present on 19 archaeological pieces and uh, nine experimentally produced facets. Data was processed with the SENSOMAP uh, software, and we used two 3D area surface texture parameter for roughness. We selected one height parameter, which is SQ, uh, and one hybrid parameter, which is SDR. So SQ quantifies the statistical distribution of height values around the mean plane, and SDR um, quantifies the complexity of the surface. Now I will briefly present some of our results concerning the composition of ochre. So ochre pieces at Pocket Peak Cave uh, feature different colors and textures, as you can see in the photo. We identified macroscopically, macroscopically six types of raw material, and our analysis suggests uh, the presence of hematite, goethite, magamite, as well as quartz, micas, clays, ferts, polish, and carbonates as well. Ochre pieces are present throughout the sequence. So horizontally, we identified accumulation areas of ochre pieces and ochre processing tools that were identified, um, that were interpreted as areas devoted to ochre processing. More than 40% of the ochre pieces from this site are modified. The most common modifications are flaking and striations produced by grinding. Um, we have seen interesting diachronic changes in the way ochre was modified in the site. So there is a general gradual increase of flaking, pitting and scraping marks from the bottom of the, to the top of the stratigraphy, while grinding becomes increasingly rare through time. Among the ground ochre pieces, almost 100 bear two or more adjacent facets that form geometric shapes as the one you can see on this slide. We studied striations produced by grinding on some of those multifaceted pieces more in detail by using surface analysis. Some of the scanned surfaces after data processing, meaning form and outlier removal, filling of non-measured points, etc., are shown on the left. Um, on the right, you can see box plots that represent the SQ values, which, as I, I remind you, quantifies roughness. Um, so we have the roughness values for both experimental and archaeological facets. So let's see a little bit more in detail these box plots. So X, SQ values of experimental facets that are on the left, the gray toned uh, box plots, are presented by ochre and grindstone on which they were processed, meaning uh, the sandstone, the quartzite and the limestone um, grindstones. Box plots in color, on the other hand, represent the archaeological pieces. Each color represents single pieces, and each box plot represents one facet for each piece. For example, uh, each yellow box plot represents one single facet 
of ochre piece number 1806, okay? So the experimental data suggests that grinding three ochre pieces on different textures, on sandstone, quartzite, and limestone grindstones, produce facets that are characterized by clearly different roughness values. Um, we can see as well that values can be extremely variable for each archaeological piece. By comparing the archaeological facets with the experimental pieces, pieces bear facets that were produced with different grindstones, arguably at different times. Here we present SQ and SDR values. So um, experimental uh, pieces are the three uh, biplots on the left. Each plot represents one piece. Dots of the same color identify measurements taken on the same facets, and gray dots identify the overall variability of the archaeological sample. Roughness values recorded on facets belonging to the same ochre piece identify cases in which facets show similar values and others in which some facets show clearly different values. Our experimental results suggest the first pattern is likely to reflect cases in which several facets were ground on the same type of grindstone, with the second resulting from the facets ground on different types of grindstone, possibly during different grinding sessions. The particle size analysis of experimentally produced ochre powder showed us that depending on the raw material of the ochre piece and also of the grindstone that was used, ochre powders of different granulometry and color are produced. For example, ochre powder produced with a sandstone grindstone uh, are much coarser than uh, ochre powders produced with other types of grindstones. So you can see in the photos how color and texture can change a lot according to the type of grindstone that we use to produce the powder. So the fact that different types of grindstones were used to produce ochre powder as used by our, our roughness analysis is therefore very significant. Many researchers consider that finer powder are adapted to symbolic activities, while coarser powders are adapted to utilitarian activities thus suggesting that porcupic ochre powders were used for a variety of functions. Analysis of the size of ground pieces with more than one facet also suggests curation of the objects. Pieces with just one facet are significantly smaller than those with more facets. This finding is consistent with the idea that large pieces were ground a number of times to produce tiny quantities of ochre powder. The production, again, of small amounts of ochre powder is usually considered more consistent with symbolic activities, such as body painting, for instance. Um, the, produ the production of patterns on different media, or for example, for signaling. However, we must say that uh, small quantities of ochre powder can also be used for medicinal purposes or for hafting, for example. So over the past few years, different methods were developed to study ochre, including technologic, uh, petrographic, elemental, and mineralogical analysis. And although surface texture analysis um, allows to reduce intra-observer error and can provide very important data on how ochre was processed, it is still extremely rare to use this in ochre studies. In the case of Pocket Peak Cave, surface analysis has been fundamental to determine that ochre was processed using different types of tools, probably to produce small quantities of ochre powder. These findings are consistent with the idea that ochre powder was used for a variety of purposes and that symbolic activities may have been among these. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you for this beautiful lecture, which is at the intersection of uh, different topics and which gives uh, a new example of the added value of uh, confocal microscopy. And uh, from my side, uh, I should say that it's a beautiful transurgical approach. Uh, still with the confocal microscope, and now for a, a very interesting issue uh, which concerns. Uh, the, the different uh, questions, philosophers and specialists. Please, Antoine. Uh, 
Bonjour, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, fine. Good. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see the full screen? Yes, perfect. Good. Okay, good. <clears throat> Uh, yes, so hi everyone, my name is Antoine, uh, I'm a paleontologist, and I'm a specialist of evolution of pigs in Africa, uh, hence my, uh, my picture. Uh, today I'm going to try to combine two of the topics that I've been exploring using uh, confocal microscopy. One is uh, diet reconstruction using uh, micro uh, studies of the teeth, and another one is more related to uh, taphonomy and how to identify uh, anthropic marks from non-anthropic marks using uh, geometric morphometric based shape analysis on the on the marks observed on the bone. So the idea is more to present some quick uh, case studies and to show uh, the, the potential for the studies. Uh, and this, of course, was done with lots of uh, collaborators, some colleagues, uh, some students on the macroware part, also for the bone taphonomy part. Uh, and uh, in both cases, try to understand how to use confocal microscopy to better quantify biological surfaces on teeth and bones using uh, various scales, a very, very microscopic scale for the microware and something more uh, macroscopic for the cut marks and uh, other types of bone surface modification. So I would like to thank all my collaborators for this particular uh, project. Uh, so first, I'm going to start with the uh, dental microware. Then I will present the bone surface modification study. And at the end, I'm going to try to uh, see if we could try to combine studies and, and get something from the two types of studies uh, to reply to one particular question. So dental microware textures are known to reflect particularly well the diet in mammals. So a wide range of mammals have been studied for that. Browsers that feed on uh, leaves and fruits. Uh, grazers that feed on grass, omnivores that feed on any, uh, everything that you could imagine. Uh, and it has been applied for many, many uh, types of mammals, not only mammals, but mostly mammals. micro studies study is the characterization of microcos microscopic scars that you can see at the surface of the enamel. Uh, you can see here, for example, the 3D model and a 2D photo simulation based on the confocal microscope. It's, uh, it's part of an enamel facet from a lower molar of a bison, a modern bison. This is only part of the enamel facet, uh, but already this takes a lot of time to, to measure. That's why usually we do uh, microwave analysis only a very small part, which is represented here, and that is around 200 by 200 microns. Uh, there is a lot of debate in the literature regarding what, what is exactly the mechanism, mechanism of formation of microware uh, scars at the surface of the uh, enamel facets. Uh, basically, the two main hypotheses is one that is relating the microware to the content in phytoliths of the plants that are consumed by the mammals. And the other uh, hypothesis is that phytoliths uh, are, are usually not uh, hard enough to wear the teeth and that the, the microwave is more related to the amount of dust that is uh, adhering, adhering that is uh, on the top of the, of the food. Uh, of course, uh, some people believe that the two uh, kinds of uh, mechanisms are important, but uh, you really see a very uh, active, very dynamic debate on, uh, on, the, on the physics of uh, enamel uh, wear uh, with lots of papers that are uh, disagreeing with each other mainly because the story is uh, very difficult. It's very difficult to understand uh, at such uh, fine scales uh, how the different materials will interact with each other. So we still don't really understand that, but we know uh, that there is a signal that is related to diet. Uh, we don't know if it's a direct signal related to the content of the plants with the different types of phytoliths, or if it's an indirect signal, for, signal, for example, uh, the grass, they live in areas with a lot of dust, and that's why you can easily uh, identify them in the diet using microware. Uh, the method is relatively simple. You have to take molds of uh, enamel facets using uh, polyvinyl siloxane silicone. 
And so you have an example here on uh, modern wild boars. Then uh, we can study this mold using the microscope. The good thing with the method I'm going to show is that you don't need to make any cast. You can study directly the, the, the negative uh, made with the silicone. Uh, we have to choose the facet. You have two kinds of facets that are used. During the mastication in mammals, you have two phases. One phase is the crushing phase, and one phase is the shearing phase. And you can study the two types of facets depending on the animals. For example, in primates, we, you can study both types of facets. In ungulates, the crushing phase is really much uh, reduced. So usually we uh, do the study only on the shearing facets. So we place uh, the silicone under the confocal microscope using the 100 uh, magnification objective. This gets us a really nice 3D model with really fine details. So for example, this uh, surface that has been measured on a peak tooth is 200 microns, 250 microns by 330 microns. And you can see very clearly the small differences in topography. For example, here between the high points in red and the low points in blue, there is less than three microns of uh, topographic differences. Then we will take the 3D model and we will conduct different kinds of analysis. There are different ways of uh, producing some microwave parameters. What I'm presenting today is more related to the SSFA approach. So that is using scale sensitive fractal analysis. Uh, as I said before, the classic sampling strategy is usually uh, randomly selected uh, one to four small surfaces within the facet. The facet size can be, uh, the, the surface size can be a bit different uh, among uh, studies. Uh, usually it's around 200 by 200 microns. It can be a bit smaller in some studies. So the SSFA parameters are automatically uh, compiled. There is no uh, there is, of course, some uh, subjective choice for the, the place that you want to target uh, when you do the measurement. But once the surface is measured, there is no uh, or little uh, uh, observer effect. And so uh, we managed to get some uh, parameters with little uh, intra and inter-observer uh, differences. Uh, of course, there is some uh, data comparability issues when you're uh, comparing data that were uh, measured with different uh, types of microscopes, different models of confocal microscopes. Uh, but if you stay within one uh, type, it's relatively uh, robust. So the main SSFA parameters that we use, one is anis anisotropy, and it's uh, related to the pref pref preferential uh, orientation of the microwave structures. So we have low anisotropy when it's uh, uh, isotropic surface. And if you have, for example, striae that are oriented in the same direction, you will have a high anisotropy. Complexity, it's more related to the rigosity of the surface, and you can try to quantify differences between simple surfaces, such as this one, with uh, not that many different types of microwave, mostly uh, small striae and small punctuations, small pits. And surfaces like this one that would be uh, characterized as more complex surfaces, with uh, punctuation pits of very different size, small one, uh, uh, moderate one and big one, as well as many different strains. And then you can look at the same, the same uh, parameter, complexity, but within the small surfaces by dividing the surface into sub-surfaces. And for each sub-surface, you can compile the complexity and look if this complexity is the same in the different uh, sub-surface. In that case, you have a surface that is homogeneous. Or in this case, you have a surface that is very heterogeneous because none of the nine squares uh, have similar uh, complexity values. And finally, textural field volume is uh, looking at the, 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 small, the small depressions that you find at the surface of the NML and that are filled with uh, cubes of known uh, size and depend, uh, based on the total volume that you can fill using the, the, this size of cubes, you can determine a textual field volume in a micrometers a cube. So this, for example, we know that it works pretty well at discriminating different uh, groups of mammals with very different diets. So an example with the group I know, I know best, the pigs. I, I mostly study the pigs from Africa. Uh, we have uh, five uh, modern species, one, uh, so two species of warthogs, Kumba from the Lion King, 
some species of omnivorous pigs that is called bush pig in Africa. One species from uh, Eurasia that is omnivorous wild boar and another species from Africa, which is called the giant forest hog. And that is a mixed feeder uh, eating mostly uh, grass and leaves uh, and uh, very little uh, other types of uh, diet items. And the, the pumba, of course, is not the one in the Lion King, but the real one is feeding almost exclusively on grass. So for example, here you have some uh, different surfaces. The surfaces in omnivores, they tend to be uh, complex with uh, very deep uh, depressions with uh, not many uh, striae. Uh, that's why you see here the high uh, values in uh, ASFC, which is a complexity, and also relatively high values in uh, heterogeneity. And the phacocarus, the grass eater, it's characterized by low values in complexity and low values in uh, heterogeneity. And the mixed feeder, the herbivorous mixed feeder, the giant forest hog is, is characterized also by low uh, complexity values and also relatively high uh, heterogeneity values. So this was our validation using the modern pigs. And then, for example, I tried to uh, reconstruct the diet from uh, extinct Pleistocene African Swiss that we, we find in, uh, in uh, Africa. And this example is uh, two species coming from two Ethiopian sites. One is uh, Colpocus limnetes, this one, KL, which is found in the lower Omo Valley from Ethiopia. And this one is Colpocus majus, which is found uh, for this particular study. We studied the specimen from Conso. Uh, which is another Ethiopian site. Uh, all the sites are very old. It's dated between uh, one, uh, two, uh, 3 million and 1 million. And so, for example, here, if you look at the, the median and the interquartile range of the fossil specimens, the Colpocus limnetes, they fall relatively uh, close to the, uh, the values for Phacocarus in terms of both complexity and heterogeneity, which suggests that probably they were eating lots of grass. And this is also congruent with the data we got from the stable carbon isotopes. A bit more difficult to interpret the data from the Colpocus majus, which is kind of close to the Hylocarus, but not exactly. It's, it's a bit outside of the, the, the reference data set for the modern pigs. Uh, so maybe it's a mixed feeder. It looks at least to be uh, something very different from omnivores. But what exactly it's doing, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit mysterious so far. Uh, so this is an example with very different diets. Of course, it works relatively well, but we can also look at more subtle differences. For example, within one species among different uh, geographic populations or uh, between uh, specimens that, are, uh, that died during different seasons. So for example, in the wild boars, we have uh, lots of seasonal di di variations in diet uh, you, that you can see on the, on the right. And for example, in my uh, modern sample reference data set of wild boars, I have two populations with very different uh, microware uh, textures. One is from Poland, Białowieża, and one is from France, Chizé. And they are very different. Unfortunately, we don't really understand why they are different because we don't have precise data uh, about the time of death of the individuals or exactly about the, the differences in diet. So it's a bit difficult to interpret. But potentially, it's related to differences in uh, seasons or also in uh, environment. Uh, so that could be a promising tool, the microware, to detect seasonal and geographic directory variations in the uh, fossil uh, mammals. And this can have a lot of uh, implications for uh, archaeologists and paleontologists. So an example was, that was what we tried to do with my colleagues from uh, Toulouse, uh, Marine Gardeur. She's doing a PhD uh, thesis on uh, Mesolithic uh, faunas and uh, their exploitation by Homo sapiens. And we try to look at the microarray signatures in Susprofa, the wild boar, from different sites. We compare the complexity, anisotropy, and textural field volume uh, from the site that is called Cusul de Gramma and from another site, also from Mesolithic, which is called Les Fieux. And we, we found some pretty uh, big differences if you look at the median values and also the, the dispersion around the median. Cusul uh, de Gramma has some uh, lower uh, complexity values, higher anisotropy, and lower uh, textual field volume compared to uh, Les Fieux. This could uh, probably be related to differences in diets that are re themselves related to a difference in terms of uh, 
period of uh, hunting of the wild boars by the humans, and also maybe the duration of the uh, stay of the humans in the site. Uh, so th those are the, the kind of problematics that my, my colleagues is interested in. Uh, we don't have definitive uh, answer, but for example, the Cusel de Gramma, it looks very similar in terms of median, but also dispersion with one population of Suscrofa that we get from uh, Totavel in France. And that was uh, all, the, all the specimens from this particular population. They were captured within one season, within three months, uh, between September and uh, November, uh, the same year. So it's a very uh, restricted uh, sample. So maybe it's something similar for Cusel de Gramma, but so far we don't have uh, good enough reference data sets to really uh, explore these questions. So we need to develop the data sets, so reference data sets, with, uh, with uh, specimens of known uh, period of death and known environments before we can really apply that to the archaeological sites. And there is a strong potential if you combine this kind of approach with uh, chronology, for example. So no transition, but I'm uh, switching to bigger marks. I, I'm, I've also been interested in uh, quantitative, quantitative studies of bone surface modifications and what they can learn what we can learn uh, about trophic networks and the, especially the, the transition in uh, ancient hominids from, uh, from omnivores to more carnivores. Uh, so, of course, being able to identify correctly cut marks from trampling marks, bite marks, and so on is a very uh, important issue. So we used first, uh, we developed some new methods using uh, an experimental data set, including uh, bite marks of different carnivorous mammals, different crocodilians, uh, different types of trampling marks made with different types of sediments and different types of cut marks made with different types of stone tools, uh, including different uh, cutting edge morphology and also different types of raw materials. The step is relatively easy. We can make the molds with the same product as before. Then surface acquisition using the confocal microscope. Surface treatments to get the final 3D uh, model, a bit like Alain has been showing before. and then. Based on this 3D model, for example, in that case, it's a cut mark. We can produce uh, different profiles, cross-section profiles at different places of the mark. So the protocol we developed is using 10 unique profiles extracted along each linear uh, mark, uh, every 10% of the total length of the mark, and then also one mean profile that is automatically compiled from all the unique profiles within uh, the black box that is uh, encompassing the totality of the mark. Then we can use those profiles to do some shape and size analysis using geometric morphometrics, but also a traditional morphometrics. For the GM analysis, I used uh, 60 landmarks on cross-section profiles. They were then subjected to pro-cross superimposition, so you have a profile extracted from a cut mark. Then the 60 uh, automatically uh, digitized landmarks. We can also, of course, compile very basic linear measurements, the width, the depth, and different types of angles as well. Then we will use the 2D landmark coordinates. So 60 2D landmarks, it's a total of 120 variables, which is, of course, difficult to understand for human brain. So we use uh, dimensionality reduction analysis, such as PCA, to uh, extract major variability uh, components that are more easily interpreted for us. Uh, GM is working on the principle that you are interested in the form, that is basically the morphology of the mark, and it can, it can be decomposed into shape and size. Shape will be uh, quantified by the PC score, the major axis of variation in the uh, PCA morphospace, and the size will be quantified by the, the centroid size, which is basically a mean, difference, a mean distance between uh, the barrier center of the cloud the cloud points, the point cloud. In this case, it's a very simple uh, triangle. So it's a kind of uh, average distance of all the distances between the landmarks and the barrier center. Uh, so it's a bit complex, but we made the first PCA on the mean profiles to extract some uh, major component, so some principal component axis that are related to those characteristics: depth width ratio, profile asymmetry the shape of the bottom, and of course, the centroid size, the depth and the width. We made a second PCA only on the unique profiles. And in that case, the objective was to quantify the variability of all those characteristics within one mark. So we use for that the interquartile range 
of the PC1, the interquartile range of PC2, PC3, centroid size, depth, and width. And finally, we made a final multivariate analysis combining the uh, PC scores, interquartile range, and the uh, data of centroid size into one single uh, PCA to uh, summarize all the information, both on the central, central tendency, but also on the intramark variability uh, for those various aspects. So the result we get, for example, this one is PC1 versus PC2 of the, uh, the, the, the synthetic PCA that we made at the end. And you can see that there is a relatively good separation between the different types of marks. You have the cut marks here, the bite marks of carnivore runs, crocodile runs, and here are the trampling marks. There is, of course, one area where they superpose a lot, which is an area uh, that we uh, consider to be uh, representing of uh, equifinality. And this uh, particular area of equifinality is mostly uh, restricted to the marks that are very shallow. For any mark that is deeper than uh, 30, 40 microns, uh, most of those marks are usually in the areas that do not overlap. So the same thing here with the raw, the raw data points and here with the uh, uh, summary uh, statistics. And particularly for the African context in the very ancient sites, we are mostly interested in being able to distinguish the cut marks made with basal flex from the crocodile and bite marks, from the trampling marks. And here the, the discrimination is a bit uh, better and the equifinality uh, area is a bit smaller. So we are still refining the method, uh, but there is definitely a strong potential to classify correctly and with a very objective quantitative way anthropic from non-anthropic marks from uh, ancient African sites, but also for more recent sites, there is a lot of potential to be able, for example, uh, to identify the type, the type of stone tools or the type of raw materials that has been used uh, to make some particular cut marks. Uh, basically, also with uh, very basic uh, linear measurements, we saw some uh, interesting patterns. For example, if we look at simply a bivariate graph between profile depths, and a ratio of depths uh, by width, which is a summary of the, the proportion of the profile. We saw some pretty uh, nice pattern with the bite marks that are uh, very different from uh, the cut marks and uh, a little bit uh, from the trampling marks. So clearly here, what we see, this line is a line of uh, isometry, which means that the proportion of the profile is not changing when the mark is getting deeper. And this is basically what you see in the trampling marks. When they get bit deeper, the shape of the profile is not changing too much. And for the stone tool cut marks and the bite marks, you have different allometries, which means that the, there is a strong correlation between uh, the shape, the proportion of the uh, profile, and its depth. So the shape is changing a lot when it's getting deeper. So again, most of those marks are really overlapping only in shape when they are really shallow. And anything uh, that is uh, deeper than a certain uh, threshold is really relatively easy to uh, understand, to discriminate. Uh, so the, the, the next question I want to ask is, can we relate these differences uh, in morphology uh, that is dependent on the depths with the, the precise morphology of the impacting surfaces? depending if it's cut mark, uh, cutting edges of the stone tools, uh, the, the tip of the teeth for the cro crocodiles, for example, or the different types of uh, sedimentary particles for the trampling marks. And this, this I didn't uh, do much, so this is more what I'm, I want to do in the, next, in the future. But for example, my colleague from Italy, uh, Francesco Boskin, made some really nice uh, study of associated marks and tools, and he, he showed basically the same pattern with really the, the, the shape of the cross-section that is uh, very much depending on the depth uh, of, penet of penetration of the cutting edge. And he was, really try he was really able to show this by studying exactly the stone tools that made the marks that were quantified using uh, different types of microscope. So I would like to look at that. I would like to use a very nice uh, automized uh, mechanized setting uh, to do some kind of more control experiments using uh, very well-controlled uh, stone tools and, uh, uh, and teeth. So this, for example, is one that was made by uh, our colleague, Ivan Calandra. 
And there is a really strong potential to, to compare this data, I think, at the end. Go, coming back to the microware, in fact, people are doing some kind of similar uh, experiments with microware, trying to replicate microware using some nano, nano indentation experiments and looking at the shape of the different profiles to understand which particles are really um, responsible for the microwave. Is it the phytolite or is it uh, the grit that is uh, located at the surface of the, the plants? So I, I would really like in the future maybe to try to combine this kind of methods. It's a really exciting and uh, interdisciplinary uh, idea, uh, mixing tribology, uh, where studies, material properties, taphonomy, experimental archaeology, morphometrics. And maybe I, I'm thinking of trying to use the morphometric analysis I, we developed for single marks on the microstria that you find at the surface of enamel surfaces, for example, uh, to see if we see some different types of uh, microstria that are maybe related to phytolites or some others that are more related to uh, grit. And maybe in some cases, uh, the SSFA approach from microware can also be interested for uh, uh, bone surface modification. Uh, so more similar to what uh, Alain and uh, Daniela showed for the, uh, the stone tools. And so in the, in the long term, I think there is a potential of this kind of uh, project to understand really the mechanism of striae formation at different scales and on different types of bi biological materials. But we should be able to, 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 to get data from the two kinds of uh, bi biological materials and from things that are uh, occurring at different scales. And uh, yes, thank you for your attention. So if you have any uh, question, I can try to, uh, to answer. And like uh, Hugues, sorry for the accent. Uh, I did my best. Thank you, Arthur. Your accent is far better than mine. Uh, so thank you for uh, such a beautiful demonstration. And I guess that uh, now we will, uh, we are all willing to buy a confocal microscope for producing uh, not only such beautiful uh, Images, but also so strong argumentation. Thank you, Antoine. My pleasure. Thank you for invi inviting us. Is there questions about peaks, uh, cut marks, microscope, striations? Oh, it's time for the lunch break. Okay, if uh, there are no questions, uh, Hugh, thank you very much. Thank you that you took this challenge and responsibility at the very last moment to lead our first session. Um, but I guess you are familiar, all uh, speakers were familiar to you. So, and uh, so now we'll have 20 minutes break, and after that, we'll go back to our Session two, complex digital and computational uh, methods in lithic analysis and art, including 3D uh, geometric morphometry in lithic and bone artifact studies that will be led by Professor Leora Grossman in 20 minutes. Thank you, everyone.
Okay, shall we begin? Katia okay, is shall we begin? Katia okay, shall we begin? How did you do it? <laughs> Could you repeat it? <laughs> Once was not enough. We needed to hear it many times. <laughs> Especially such magic voice as I read us. No, I, I had uh, I had YouTube on on, on another <laughs> laptop. <laughs> so um, I have one notification before we will continue. Um, so if you if you don't want to uh, if you don't want your talk to be on YouTube after we'll finish streaming, just uh, let me know personally like by email uh, and uh, we'll remove it from recorded streaming uh, because we understand that uh, today uh, we saw unpublished material and so on so just let me know please and uh, we are ready to move uh, to the uh, to our next session and uh, I'm, I'm happy to introduce you Professor Leora Grossman from the Institute of Archaeology of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel. She will lead our next session. Thank you, Elena, for, for this introduction. And in general, thank you for making this happen. Uh, it was not easy. And uh, to all the friends from Novosibirsk, of course. And I'm happy to open the second session after a very, very interesting first session, so I'm looking forward to hearing not our talk, but beyond. Uh, I will start by my presentation. I will share. Okay, I hope it works. I'm here. Yes, works. Okay, thank you. So first, uh, I will tell you that uh, I'm a prehistorian working on the big question of agriculture origin in the Southern Levant. I'm excavating sites that are from the Epipaleolithic into the Neolithic, but for the past uh, more than 15 years, I'm very interested in computational archeology. span And uh, I, what I want to today to show you, uh, the results or the, or the online developments that we are having at our computational archaeology laboratory, which I'm uh, directing. Basically, in excavation, we produce uh, large quantities, and I know it from my own, uh, of artifacts which require further processing, description, measurement, drawing, photography. All of you probably know that. And traditional documentation methods are not efficient enough to handle these increasing amount of archaeological material, and uh, they are not so accurate. And this is why we come into the picture with the aim of adding to this computational uh, development in other arenas as well. And uh, I wish I will ask you please to remember this point because. At the end, after I present a few examples of our work, I would like to go back with a question of what should we do next with all these large quantities of data. So we address some of the biggest questions in traditional archaeology, like typology, we try to link with, uh, with it studying the, and recognizing and comparing patterns, spotting out layers, identifying relationship, and build arguments to, for further interpretation. We also try to follow up the technology that is employed with our methods, whether it's lithic uh, napping or pottery or drilling or engravings of rock trying to scan in 3D and see if we could develop elements that could further understand these technologies. So, as I said, during these past two decades, we conducted research 
and develop programs which aim to harness these modern developments that we see in optics, in computer vision, computer graphics, all on archaeological artifacts. What we do is try to complete an automatic documentation procedure for almost all archaeological finds, which present in these 3D technology an accurate way, an objective and reliable way, repeatable way, way to data storage and for documenting and what most importantly, and maybe not stressed enough, information sharing. So this is the lab and some of the people and people in the lab, by the way, our, the, our next speaker is the guy here in the photo, Francesco Valletta, who will uh, introduce specific elements that we developed at the lab. We have a few 3D scanner based on the technology of structured light. And uh, in these few uh, scanners, in an easy way, and I must say, with our experience, it became quite easy and we scan many artifacts per hour. And even in a cheap way, we managed to uh, have a large database of models. What we get with the scanner, most some of you know, of course, is the surface of the 3D surface of an object, which is represented by the mesh and the coordinates, the, the surfaces and the coordinates of uh, the object, which the density in fact tells us what the quality of the scan, the quality representation of the real object, object in 3D. So far today, the lab scanned more than 150 pottery shreds, 20,000 lithic artifacts, and many, many other objects, bone, anklers, olives, grapes, seeds, figurine, coins, engravings. And all of them, we try to develop ways for documentation and research. And of course, through this long time of research, I will not be able to present all the elements that we have developed. But uh, in a nutshell, so far, we have four separate programs that deal with different artifacts that are extracted from archaeological sites. The first one is Artifact 3D, and here I will deal a little bit in depth, but Francesco Valletta uh, will even further describe the elements that are in this program. Pottery 3D that was developed by Shalom Karasik and Uzi Smilansky and has, has a very uh, sophisticated way to do typology of ceramic vessels. Uh, Arc Cut 3D is the newest program that deals with uh, engravings, with the loss of, and some of the lectures uh, before in the first session dealt with the engraving or cut marks. And this is some way, maybe in some ways similar, but also different. And here I will describe it a bit. An AGMT 3D is a geometric morphometric analysis, not for bones, but for artifacts. And here we automatically put semi landmarks on object and compare between assemblage presented in average shapes. Also here we have various uh, research questions that uh, were using this, these developments and, uh, and uh, I will not have time to present them uh, in this talk. All these programs were programmed in MATLAB, in a math uh, uh, oriented uh, program and were uh, extracted as a GUI, meaning these are programs that could be uh, shared by whoever wants to use it. Uh, we published most of the things here, most of the programs. So whatever is published, we invite whoever is interested to play with this, use it, uh, try it on other assemblages, please contact us and we are most willing to share these programs. So for Artifact 3D, in fact, each button here represents a different uh, research uh, trajectory. 
But the first thing that we felt that we have to do with all archaeological objects and specifically with lithics, because they don't have a symmetrical axis as ceramics, they're very uh, heterogenic. Uh, so we have to, first of all, analyze the complete form, the complete 3D uh, uh, model. But before the first step is to indeed position the object automatically, which will follow intrinsic characteristics of the object. And for lithic, for example, we developed two systems of positioning. One is based on the distribution of the normal vectors around the model. The other one of the distribution of mass, the direction of mass uh, of the object, but each one can be used and it doesn't matter which one, uh, just so it will be consistent and intrinsic to the assemblages that are being studied. So after going through this positioning, we developed elements for first documentation. And indeed, whoever has a model could extract these 2D representation of the object from all views. But also, we have a set of tools that can uh, take forward and analyze the assemblage depending on the research question that we have. Uh, the most basic thing after positioning, of course, is extracting the profile, the length, the width, which are quite trivial, but uh, now that they're all positioned in the same way, the comparison of the assemblage is an easy task in the most accurate way. The next thing, which is easy, very difficult in manual, manual ways, but uh, easy in computational ways, is extracting the location of the center of mass. And while comparing it to the center of the encompassing box, we could indeed get a value that will compare assemblages and show maybe the differences in their typology. In addition, we can extract the edge length of the, the 3D edge length the outline of the waviness of the uh, lateral edges of the object, calculate the edge sinuosity in various ways following the extracted profile of the object. As I said before, uh, compare the average form of the artifacts by GM geometric morphometry. And the most exciting thing that we developed and now we are uh, working on large assemblages is extracting or say segmenting the object into scars, meaning detecting automatically the ridges and the curvature and the, the uh, characteristics of each scar on the model. Each scar is segmented to the surfaces and coordinates that it represents. Now, if I just highlight the things that I talked about, and I will not go into detail to, of all of them, but, but this is a nice example of a very simple 3D parameter that can be extracted. Here in this case, we compared between pics, hand access from various sites uh, in the Arava Nachal Tzichor area, sickle blades from Kfar Achoresh Neolithic uh, blades, steroids from Ubadia, which is the earliest site in Israel, or Neolithic bifaces uh, from uh, two sites. And when we just extract this parameter, we see some sort of a conduct of change in the location of center of mass. And if we think about it, center of mass indeed represents in a way reverse engineering of the function of the tool. And like a hammer that the center of mass will always be at the edge because you need it to ham a hard the same with a knife that the center of mass has to be in the center and between the cutting edge and the handle. And this way, the differences that we see in the location of some center of mass, this small, very small parameter could help us do a sort of typology of uh, artifacts. And another thing, as I described before, the, the automatic segmentation that is done by uh, calculating the curvature in the areas of the, of the artifact, 
in combination with uh, handles of uh, geo geodesic distances, uh, we managed to uh, uh, conduct this algorithm and number the scars, their area, the orientation, their curvature, and so forth. Another thing that recently we're using is, uh, is the degree of asymmetry, which is in, indeed the profile that is, is extracted from the th 3D artifact, which is a closed uh, curve defined by the projection on its ventral plane. And in fact, what we do is uh, follow the existing existence of this line that intersect the profile into two mirror symmetrical parts. And this line, which provides the best partition of the profile, so that the two parts are at least asymmetric, meaning the most symmetrical a division of the object, this could be calculated into the degree of the, of the asymmetry between these two parts can be calculated and uh, extracted as a single numerical value. So indeed, again, we follow the 3D image, we manipulate it and by single values, we managed to compare between artifacts. And this is something we just did recently take a middle paleolithic uh, uh, points uh, and uh, also uh, specialized nappers and uh, a less specialized one. And we managed statistically to divide only by the degree of asymmetry uh, between the artifacts that they uh, manufactured. Another element, which is really hot from the stove, uh, we are now integrated in the project of analyzing steroids, rounded uh, um, artifacts that are very early in our history in the lower Paleolithic. And while analyzing this, we thought it would be good to, to develop a tool that takes into account the mathematical notion of spherical harmonics, which takes approximately 3D shape uh, very similar to the Fourier uh, transformation. And it's, it calculates the number of co coefficients that is needed to approximate the, the shape of the object and calculate its deviation from the perfect spherical form. So if you look at this uh, 3D models that we have here are spheroids, you could see the location where it deviates from the complete geometric form. This We use this specific for a research question of spheroids, but this could be applied to many, many other objects that are similar to geometric form and be compared and compare between assemblages. Now I wish to, after introducing some of the things, some of the points here in Artifact 3D and a bit from AGMT, I wish to just show you ArcCut 3D, if it will move my mouse. And the experiment that we've done in order to develop this issue was done in the Timna Park, in the Southern uh, Park in Israel, in the Arava. And there the focus was the chariot engraving. We went there to the Timna Park and scanned for a few times with our structured light uh, scanners. Uh, both one, uh, the handy scan and polymetric and reached several areas in the park which have these engravings. Then we developed in MATLAB the program ArcCut3D. And what was important for us, again, the positioning, which will be intrinsic, meaning each time we open this engraving or parts of the engravings, it will be the same way positioned because we saw that any calculation that we do of a surface, it really depends dramatically on the way the, the surface is positioned. That's why we uh, used here the distribution of the normal vectors. We chose one of our systems of positioning, the automatic position. And not only that, we, we built this program so we could repeat our analysis again and again with the same set of points. 
one of the difficulties of analyzing a surface is to go back to the same localities that were calculated before if it's not a complete surface or extract uh, a part of a surface. And as you could see here, we have here the list of points that were extracted in the program on the surface. Manually, we get, give the first push in the calculation. The red dots are marked manually, but then the automatic path is being calculated by an algorithm that takes into advantage the minimum minima path. It follows the minimum path, the minima curvature that is marked within this engraving. After extracting this, we analyze, uh, we develop as we, uh, several elements uh, which is integrated in this program. So between the points that are marked, we extract the slices of the 3D data. And after extracting this, each slice can be, uh, can calculate the angle on both edges and the depth, the width at the mid, at the mid, the midpoint, because it's important to take always the midpoint when you have the surface changing uh, all along the engraving, engraving path. The case study that we did in this case was the site 25. And in fact, we took two historical engravings. Uh, there is a debate if it's uh, uh, what part of the Iron Age it, they relate to. Uh, there is a chronological debate, but we wanted just to follow up technology, just to see if we could add with our analysis, some sort of insights on the technology of engraving these uh, these walls. So we took two, the chariot engraving and the ibex engraving. And we followed, we followed with our program, uh, several lines, many lines, averaged the data that was extracted and followed the conduct along the engraved line that we measured each time. And you could see here one of the figures that was, were engraved, one of the animals on the ibex engraving. And the third one as a control was a modern day graffiti in the park in the same site of 52. Uh, in Hebrew, it says the name Gigi. And we also wanted to see if the modern engraving, which was done just slightly by someone passing through in the park, we could differentiate it from the other historical ones and see their technological context. And without going into all the statistics that we've done, I brought here just the sum up uh, results that we have from the current uh, preliminary results that we have. In fact, if we follow the average, uh, the average engraving profiles, we see that in the chariot engraving, there is a one mode of, of uh, engraving of a single or double stroke incision. And you could see here the double stroke that shows in many uh, areas of the engraving, which are made by long continuous strokes. On the other hand, we see in the Ibex engraving, multi short strokes with overlap meaning the technique of engraving is completely different between the tools. The, the tool is used differently. And in this case, in a peeling technique in the Ibex engraving. And this, the continuous jumpy uh, modern graffiti is shown here at the bottom. So this is the case study of the engraving. And the, the, the last, case study or element that we developed that I want to introduce is combining my archeological uh, work with the 3D. We have at Nachal Ingev, the site I'm excavating now dated to 12,000 years ago, we have 35% of perforators, many uh, tools of perforation and, but also perforated stone. And we wanted to ask the question what these perforated stones were, uh, were, were um, used for and what was their technique of manufacture. 
So we analyze their morphology and technology and function by both analyzing the complete for shape, 3D shape of the object, but also developed something of the negative of the, of the object, the whole itself, the analysis of the whole itself. So we applied what you saw before, Artifact 3D with the center of mass, with the profile, which showed us the, the way uh, the artifact was drilled. We extracted the basic parameters, but also extracted the hole itself, made it as an independent item that we could analyze it and compare its shape in order to, to try to follow up the specific, with the consistency in uh, drilling these objects. And in fact, we got really interesting results that show that the perforation size, the minimum hole size is constant. The hole itself, the opening, the edges is not a uh, constant and not always symmetrical and it's biconical, but the, the average, the minimum hole at the cent most of the time at the center of the object is constant. And we see that in many cases in later, a, in later Neolithic artifact that the, these objects are used for spindle wheels. So we managed to follow the technology of its manufacture, but also have a hint, a suggestion for its uh, use. So by the few examples that I presented here, I tried to show that by apply, applying these 3D scanning and analysis, much of our tedious artifact analysis can be performed better automatically and of course more accurately. But what's interesting, we could ask new research direction that can open and address increasing sophistication and detailed analysis, including the quantification and attribute analysis that some of it I showed before. Now here, I have two general comments to, to address, maybe more theoretical for opening discussions that maybe we will have after. So what, how I see it, the advantages of this digital technology is a real paradigm shift. And from the lectures I heard before, and I'm sure the ones that follow, we are moving, and I like the, the comparison from a series of photographs to motion pictures, for, to movies. So we are rather looking now at, at finding, not by thumbing through a photo al album, but the digital era allows us to look at our findings from numerous dimensions. So now we are lucky to target these issues and resolve using traditional approach and benefit from this data that are only accessible by applying these digital methodologies. And the final comment that I wish to address here, and I started off with that with a huge amount of data that we have, not the real archeological artifacts, but the data of analysis, the 3D data that we're collecting is becoming uh, enormous. And we need a solution for this exponential growth of data. And I believe the next step should be a sort of collaboration oriented towards developing data management tools for these our archeological communities worldwide establishing a virtual environment for all documented data for comparative analysis. Let's say we should have our own Google-like because as I saw before, and as we are now collecting, we have enormous uh, data, virtual data that we should learn how uh, to share. So this is my talk for now. And I want to thank, first of all, my mentor, Uzi Smilansky, because of him, I started at all at uh, years ago at the Weizmann Institute. My students who are developing with me all the methods, and one of them you will hear soon. Avshalom Karasik, who's at the IAA, has a similar lab and works directed more to ceramic artifacts. And of course, all the members of my laboratory. Thank you very much.
Uh, th thank you, Leora. And uh, my, uh, I have a question um, about your study of, of the tools for drilling. What kind of software did you use except Artifact 3D? We developed a new tool, another button, let's say, for Artifact 3D. Uh, it's, a, it's a MATLAB procedure that we wrote. Uh, and it's now integrated in Artifact 3D, and we could share it with you if you're interested. Yes, thank you very much. And you also did the, the CT scanning for, for drilled uh, artifacts, right? No, we're not using CT scanning. No. We're using simple 3D, 3D modeling. Model. Uh, we scan many uh, per hour or per time, and this way we have a lot of data and we, we use this uh, digital data for the analysis. Okay, thank you. So any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Leora, thank you for your brilliant results and very amazing results. Mm -hmm. By the way, I have a, um, so the most interesting now is a new software based on petroglyphs. Uh, because I've seen <laughs> several of your software. <laughs> you said it, you've seen it in the, its early forms. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, so it still has some connection to the early forms. Uh, it's developed, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, the petroglyphs, uh, it's uh, the very new one. Uh, I just want to, to, to make one small comment uh, about uh, the first type of the uh, uh, engravings, uh, charity. Uh, Carry, chariot. Chariot uh, engraving. So there are uh, two types of the cross section. So the second type of the cross sections with uh, such, such kind of bulk in, in the uh, so um, uh, in the bottom. It's usually uh, such kind of profile. It appears when the instrument uh, uh, that produced uh, yeah, the engravings yeah. become blunt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, become blunt and sometimes it it, co it can go back. So uh, according to some of the experimental data, but we, we, we did you. it uh, with uh, bones. So if you, if you will need, I will send you some um, uh, articles or references. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's in Russian, <laughs> but, but anyway. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you will you will also translate it because my Russian is poor, but uh, um, we, in fact, were working now on trying to see if we could really recognize the tool itself. The first step is recognizing the gesture that the, the way the, the engraving itself is being conducted through uh, the, the lines, whether they're curved or straight. And indeed, there is a way to, to go in order to really typify the tool itself and maybe it's becoming a blunt tool. Maybe you're right. This is uh, something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, okay. we need uh, to talk privately. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. <Yes. laughs> um, okay. So if there are any questions, I'm very proud and happy uh, to present uh, Francesco Valletta, who will introduce uh, part of his PhD uh, research directions, right, Francesco? The floor is yours. Yes. First of all, I want to um, I want to thank you all the organization for inviting me and uh, and for uh, making it, this all possible. Then I will share my screen. Um, share screen. Okay, and uh, okay, I hope you're seeing the... We're seeing, it's fine. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so I'm going now to present uh, briefly, I hope, the, um, the main results of my PhD project that I conducted uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem in the Institute of Archaeology, the Computational Archaeology Lab, under the supervision of Professor Lear Grossman. And, um, and the topic of my project uh, are uh, prehistoric learning communities, and uh, I plan to, to track them. I propose to track them based on uh, 3D attributes of lithic artifacts. So, 
First of all, I will uh, uh, explain a little bit of a chronocultural framework of the terminal Upper Paleolithic in, uh, in the Levant, in Israel. And uh, this is a period characterized uh, between 23,000 and 11 and a half thousand uh, from now, and um, is characterized by a progressive intensification of the exploitation of local resources, attested by composite tools, by uh, grounding and pounding tools, and so on and so forth. And then another trend that we uh, observe is the progressive increase in symbolic behaviors, including decoration, including beads, and including amazing burials, especially in the Natufian, but also in earlier periods. And uh, finally, especially in the end of this period, corresponding to the Natufian cultural entity, we see the appearance of permanent architecture and uh, possibly of uh, sedentism. That is uh, the first step, let's say, towards uh, agriculturalism and Neolithic. Okay, in um, this period, the terminal Upper Paleolithic, uh, we have uh, a series of traditionally defined uh, cultural entities that uh, are traditionally used to define the cultural dynamics at the time. These cultural entities are mainly uh, tracked based on uh, typological traits of the lithic assemblages, like the type of tools and uh, other more general attributes. But uh, which are the cultural processes that uh, are behind this uh, variability in, uh, in lithic attributes behind this, uh, these patterns that we observe in the archaeological record. Okay, now I will have to introduce a series of um, theoretical objects. Uh, the main one, the basic unit of our, um, of our analysis uh, is the learning community, meaning uh, a community within which specific cultural traits are vertically transmitted from one generation to another. Cultural traits can be transmitted vertically, as we said, within, uh, within learning communities, but also horizontally, meaning among learning community through different networks of uh, communication. This define two different uh, hierarchical levels in the transmission of uh, of, of cultural traits and uh, uh, possibly in the identity of uh, past people. We have uh, the um, lower hierarchical level that is uh, characterized by vertical transmission and corresponds to learning communities. And then we have a higher hierarchical levels that uh, corresponds to uh, horizontal transmission in a larger network, so uh, it may represent the identity of, uh, of people on a more wide scale. Is it possible to track this, uh, um, to track these differential levels, differential transmission based on the archaeological record? Uh, based on the literature that we browsed very carefully, <coughs> we saw that uh, uh, traits that uh, are more likely to be maintained within, uh, um, within learning communities are the traits with the low visibility and, uh, um, high, technolo and high technological uh, rigidity, meaning that uh, they are more difficult to be integrated in an existing technological uh, background, while traits that are more visible in the interactions among uh, people and they are more easily integrated in a, a technological background, meaning technologically malleable, are more likely to be transmitted along uh, cultural networks among uh, different communities. So what we know about learning communities in the terminal Paleolithic of the Levant? We have uh, uh, cultural entities, that we see that are defined uh, based on highly visible and technologically malleable typological traits. So they are more likely to represent uh, cultural, net cultural networks that rather than single learning communities. 
there is a series of studies in the, in the past that try to define subgroups within these cultural entities based on uh, different, uh, different traits, like uh, typological composition, again, uh, size of microliths uh, and other more uh, quantitative attributes and also technological traits. Our, in our specific, um, specific project, uh, we decided uh, to focus on the more uh, technologically rigid and uh, low visibility traits of the reduction sequence and to use them to track specific learning communities. This, um, to track the possible continuity in the population of an area by a single community, we, we decided to focus on a geographically restricted area that was uh, inhabited during different stages of the terminal Paleolithic. And in this con context, we, de we developed a series of novel 3D-based tools to increase the objectivity or repeatability of the resolution of our analysis. So, the focus of our analysis was uh, in Gavaria, located uh, on the eastern shore of the Galilee Sea. In this area, we have a series of uh, different uh, terminal epipaleolithic, terminal paleolithic uh, uh, cultural entities in content. The earlier one is the Atlitian, representing the, the late stage of the Upper Paleolithic. Then we have uh, the Nitsanan and the Kebaran, representing the early stage of the epipaleolithic. And finally, the later cultural entity that uh, we are going to, to analyze is the geometric baron that represents uh, the middle stage of the Pipaleolith. In Engevaria, we have uh, uh, all four of these uh, cultural entities represent. We have Nachal Engev 1, attributed to the Atlitian, Engev 4, attributed to the Nitsana, early Pipaleolithic, Engev 1, attributed to the Kebaran as well, early Paleolithic, and Inge free attributed to the geometric baron, middle epipaleolithic. Finally, to control the, uh, variabil the possible variability and continuity that, uh, that we can establish among these uh, Engev sites, we established uh, two control sites in the Sharon coastal plain, both attributed to the early epipaleolithic uh, Kebaran cultural entities, Nahal Hadera 4, and Poleg 18. Okay, our methods. Uh, our methods combined uh, traditional technological analysis with 3D based quantitative analysis. Traditional technological analysis was uh, uh, consisted in uh, sorting the artifacts in different uh, based on their um, role in the reduction sequence. Uh, both uh, like uh, general categories like uh, maintenance rather than production and also more fine categories like blade, blade uh, and so on or different types of CPs. And then each of the, um, of the blanks and of, uh, and of the course was described based on a series of qualitative and quantitative attributes. So we have a chain operatoire and attribute analysis. Secondly, we, decide, we decided to improve the, the objectivity and the, and the precision of this traditional analysis, combining it with 3D analysis. We, 3D analysis was based on 3D models cut from the computational archaeology laboratory that Leo widely exp explained. 3D models can be captured with scanner, but other, also with other methodology like photogrammetry. The important thing is that in the end, we have a model of a surface of an object defined by a fine mesh of triangles. Okay, we uh, decided to focus on a series of attributes of the, of the artifacts that can be, cal can be calculated based on this uh, 3D mesh. The first uh, um, attributes that we wanted to test uh, was uh, the edge angle of, um, of artifacts. We saw that we, we know that measuring edge angles uh, is always a demanding task. 
object um, subject to a lot uh, of ambiguity and uh, errors. So we, def we develop a methodology uh, that allow to, uh, um, to objectively and, repeat and repeatedly measure the angle between two surfaces of uh, any artifact based uh, on the automatic segregation of the vertices on one and the other surfaces. Uh, in addition, this methodology allowed to define the most regular portion of the angle on which uh, to calculate the to calculate more reliably the, the angle between the two surfaces. We tested with, with this methodology on uh, a relatively small sample of microliths uh, from different uh, epipaleolithic uh, cultural entities. And uh, although the sample was very small, we had some uh, encouraging results. We were able to see, for example, that the uh, microliths uh, from the Ram uh, Ramonian cultural entity were very homogeneous uh, in their angle and in their mean thickness. Very similar angle was also observed for the geometric baron uh, assemblages. While, for example, when we look at two different uh, Nitsanan assemblages, there's a relatively high variability among them. Anyway, since we saw that uh, based on these digital models, it was possible to try to characterize lithic assemblages in a very objective way, we decided to go further and to develop a series of uh, a series of measuring tools to quantify uh, technological attributes of the of lithic artifacts, specifically of flint cores. We relied on the to do so. We relied on the automatic segmentation in uh, in scars that uh, uh, can be performed with the uh, artifact 3D. Uh, then, after the segmentation, is each uh, for each assemblage, uh, it was manually defined which scars represent the striking platform and which scars represent the production blanks. So the input by the user is very limited and very repeatable. Uh, we defined a series of features. Um, the, the main one, the first one, is uh, the represent the reduction modality, uh, allow to differentiate uh, between narrow and wide fronted cores based uh, on the ratio of between the, the thickness and the width of the, um, of the cores that in turn is based on the automatic technological positioning of the artifact. Secondly, uh, we analyzed the, the longitudinal profile of each of the um, production, uh, production blank removal scars on the, on the core surfaces by calculating the angle uh, between the most regular portion of the striking platform and each of these different strips along the automatically uh, defined along the, the blank scar. Finally, we measured the, the degree of, uh, of abrasion of the striking platform, striking platform uh, edge uh, based on the average curvature of the, of the ridge between the edge and the, the different uh, scar blank, blank scars. So now I'm going to summarize uh, the, the results uh, of our analysis, uh, combining the traditional analysis and the technological analysis of engraved materials. The traditional analysis uh, of uh, blanks um, highlighted that one of the main differences among the, among the assemblages uh, can be seen in the kind of platforms of the, of the blanks. We see that uh, although almost all the, or of the platforms are linear, in uh, NGF1 and NGF3, Kebaran and Geometric Kebaran, we have uh, uh, a majority of punctiform platforms, while in NGF4, Nitsanan, we have uh, a majority of flat platforms. Another, and uh, this uh, pattern can be related uh, with the variability in the technique of napping. Uh, speci specifically uh, soft hammer versus uh, organic hammer. 
Another uh, feature, that uh, traditional feature that can differentiate the, the blanks produced in Ingev area uh, is the, the width of the blanks. We see that uh, while uh, Ingev 3 and Ingev 1, again, present sim a similar value of narrower blanks, blanks are wider in Ingev 4, in average. And um, going on to um, attributes, of course, uh, we were able, again, to separate Ingev 4 from Ingev 3. We see that uh, um, this pattern, this separation is visible based on the distribution of cortex on the course. We have uh, more uh, lateral cortex uh, in uh, Ingev 1 and 3 and more distal cortex in uh, Ingev 4. And also in the reduction sequence, reduction modality. We have more narrow fronted cores in the Kebaran and geometric Kebaran sites, while more wide fronted cores in the Nitzanon site. This same pattern in reduction, uh, in reduction modality can be seen based on the 3D based uh, attribute representing the same, uh, the same feature. We see again that uh, uh, narrow fronted cores are uh, more are more uh, better represented uh, in uh, Ingev one and three, and also in the other two control Kebaran sites on the Sharon plain, while the average average value is more uh, towards the um, wide fronted cores for uh, Nahal Engev 1, that is Atlitian, the earlier occupation of Engev area, and Engev 4. When we, uh, when we look at the, at the scar blank profile, we have uh, um, an even finer subdivision of the assemblages. We can uh, group them in three different clusters. We have uh, the um, Nahal Engev 1 and Engev 4 that present uh, generally straight profile with uh, uh, not a lot of change in angle along the along the the blank length while we have a homogeneously convex so with the angle homogeneously decreasing uh, in angle 1 and in angle 3 and uh, a more sharp drop in the angle from the proximal to the distal part in the two Sharon uh, um, Sharon sites. Finally, when we look uh, at the um, at the abrasion of the of the platform edge, we have uh, an even different uh, uh, distribution of the assemblages. We have no difference at all uh, among the Engev one, three, and four, and Nahal Engev sites, while Nahal Hadera in the Sharon plane present a sensibly higher value in average. Um, the um, observation of the observation of the core platforms highlighted that uh, in Nahal Hadera 5, the abrasion is covering the blank removals. And this, uh, is pos this uh, suggests that the abrasion happened after the, um, the removal of blanks. So it's not related to uh, technology is not related to the extraction of blanks, but probably to some secondary use of the of a course as a heavy duty tools or, or something similar. So to summarize, we have a series of sites attributed to four different cultural entities. Based on technological um, based on te technological attributes, uh, blank platform type, uh, blank width, uh, and reduction modality, it's possible to group them in two main groups. One represented by Nahel Engev 1 and Engev 4, at Lithium and Nitzanon occupation of Engev area, and one represented by all the other Kebaran and Geometric Kebaran sites, in, both in Engev area and uh, in, uh, um, in the Sharon Plain. A different uh, partition can be highlighted uh, based on the blank profile, uh, while still hold the differentiation between uh, um, Atlitan and Itzanan and the rest, 
but the Engev, um, Engev uh, Kebaran and Geometric Kebaran present different values uh, from uh, the Sharon uh, coeval sites. Finally, uh, a third, uh, part, a third partition can be, can be proposed based on the platform abrasion with all the Engev sites presenting a relatively low value while uh, Nahal Khadera presenting a higher value. So what, we, what this uh, uh, analysis, this quantitative data can tell us about the um, cultural entities and uh, manufacturing traditions in the Epipaleolithic and Upper Paleolithic. First of all, when we look at Engev area, we have, uh, we can see that uh, we have two historically uh, unrelated learning communities that, uh, that uh, occupy the area subsequently. We have uh, uh, earlier occupation represented by uh, Nahal Engev 1 and Engev 4, and possibly a later occupation represented by Engev 1 and 3. These two groups present very different uh, technological traits uh, on uh, many levels. Instead, when we look at all the Kebaran and geometric Kebaran sites, we see a certain technological continuity among all these sites. But still, we, can, we are able to, um, to separate them and, uh, to, uh, on a hierarchically lower level. We can see so that both uh, the areas were occupied by group belonging to the same wide tradition, but uh, with sli two slightly different technological traditions. In synthesis, we see that the uh, 3D-based uh, measure um, can, be, can be used to, to track and to reconstruct many different aspects uh, of uh, the population dynamics in the past. And uh, in addition, this uh, this series of, uh, of tools that we developed can be, can be applied to many different archaeological questions. One of them, for example, on which we ran just a very short pilot project, is the classification of carinated artifacts. Um, that is uh, one very open question. How to define a carinated artifact from a carinated cores? How to define tools from cores? And uh, measuring the the edge angle, um, the edge angles uh, of uh, of tools and the edge angles, of course, is possible to separate them. Sorry, uh, yeah, to separate them and uh, to see that they present different profiles. And based on these profiles, it's so possible to objectively separate cores from tools. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, thank you also for all the people that uh, helped me during my PhD. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be very glad to answer. Thank you, Francesco. Are there any questions? I have a question. Uh, Francesco, could you go back to the, uh, uh, yes, to the slide? Yes. And uh, the main question, why do you think that uh, the difference, technological and typological difference between NG1 and G3 uh, and uh, with uh, NG4 and NG1? Nahal NG1 is uh, how to say reflection of the different uh, uh, technological tradition. Uh, I, I will explain. Uh, we have uh, one uh, uh, LGM site uh, in Central Asia with uh, five layers. And uh, in all of these layers, we have a transition uh, in between um, such kind of tradition from the crenated uh, uh, cores and uh, of course with uh, curved profiles uh, with, a different, uh, with a quite acute angles to the prismatic and narrow faced cores with, uh, how to say, more blunt, uh, mm -hmm. angles and so on so but it is uh, uh, exactly the same line of development and it is uh, exactly the same cultural tradition so uh, and uh, the difference is um, looks like uh, more or less the same that you you have uh, you have showed us 
so why do you think that it is uh, different technological traditions in why in, inside one cultural entire entire uh, uh, then uh, it could be different uh, chronological part of one cultural um, of one culture for example um, okay uh, there is uh, um both uh, in Gav 1, that is attributed to the Kabaran, and uh, in Gav 4, represents uh, uh, possibly very close uh, chronological, or possible very chronologically close, and of course, geographically close. They are like 800 meters from one to, to the other. So, um, but uh, they present a markedly different uh, um, reduction, reduction sequence. A markedly different uh, uh, tool assemblages because uh, uh, we have, uh, by definition, Kebaran microliths in Engev1 and Nithanan microliths uh, in Engev4. There is many other uh, technological technological um, technological aspects that uh, are present in four, but these uh, uh, are not present uh, in uh, in one, and the opposite, of course. So there's really a clear cut differentiation between the two in uh, possibly a short amount of uh, centuries, probably is, uh, not even millennia. And uh, the difference is much more pronounced between these two almost contemporaneous sites than, for example, between Engev4 and Nahal Engev1. And Nahal Engev1 is uh, at least for what we know about, we don't have, we don't have a lot of uh, direct uh, dates of these sites, but uh, for what we know about other sites attributed to the same cultural entities, there's much more time between uh, Enge, uh, Engev 4 and Nahal Engev 1 than between Engev 4 and Engev 1. And this is a sharp change in all aspects of material culture. So okay. it's, it's unlikely to be a, just a transition. Mm. Uh, Tom, yeah, I think uh, that we are in Central Asia, we were just lucky to, to get such kind of sites where it was possible to trace everything. And there is a Levant, Levantine and people are listening with can go back to the, the do you remember that old old discussion uh, about uh, the, the transition from one type of the microlith to the different type? Yeah. yeah, inside. If I may add, uh, uh, one of the nice things of, of this work is that uh, not only typologically, uh, as you know, Francesco is an archaeologist, so first he gives the real data, the archaeology, the typology, and so forth, but the, the elements that he found in 3D at least in one of the parameters, show what is very close and what is not, unrelated to how the tools look like. Yeah, yes. so, so that's, that's, the, that's what's important here. Yeah, and also uh, important here is that uh, Francesca, he catch uh, the difference in the angle of, in the microlis and after he, yeah. he didn't stop on the angle, of microlis, he, he goes further yep. to the angle of the cores, uh, exactly. of the uh, negatives of the cores, and everything like this. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so from this point of view, so uh, even if you're not sure approaches. about the typological changes, mm -hmm. some of the elements, as he explained so well, some of the elements that are inherent in the society that are invisible, you know, are inherent from generation to generation and can yes. show us connections. Exactly. And uh, if, <laughs> if there is connection among them, we expect to have uh, continuity, at least in some of these uh, more conservative traits, the ones that are more less visible and less uh, yeah. malleable. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Francesco. I think uh, Xenia, you oh. are next. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We, we have one more question from oh. uh, yeah fr from our colleague Svetlana. Uh, she asks um, Francesca, um, uh, studying um, studying the angle, uh, it was possible to differentiate the uh, soft 
inorganic hammer stones and organic billets or not? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, yes, that's a, that's a good question. And we, we spent a lot of, uh, wait a second, I have to, I can go back to, it is. Uh, because we don't have uh, information about the about the actual hammerstone that uh, that they used, but uh, we yeah here. Um, but we were able to just to, to measure it, and then we we the first our first thought was to uh, relate the angle of the the profile actually of the blank scars to the how to the to the hammerstone to the kind of hammerstone or uh, of organic uh, or organic uh, tool and um, maybe relating it to the with the information from the traditional analysis we saw that uh, in uh, in gf4 we have more flat uh, um, platforms that can be related with the uh, organic uh, organic billet direct or indirect now is uh, quite dif difficult to separate so we and in uh, in gave one and three we had uh, uh, punctiform platforms that are related uh, with the soft hammerstone so uh, this kind of profile that we see in in gave four can possibly be related to the uh, organic, uh, while this more uh, uh, convex, regularly convex uh, uh, profile that we see in NGAV1 and 3 can be related uh, uh, with, the, or, uh, with the stone, soft stone. Thank you. That's a possibility. We didn't, uh, we didn't have any experimentation and this is a very interesting uh, possibility to develop. We have. Yeah, we should, we did Time. I have <laughs> <laughs> Next time we have. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so, um, by the way, uh, Francesco, uh, all his work was published. And uh, also, ah, yeah. this, also this year, he didn't put it in the slideshow. Also this year, his uh, latest, our latest development of the three D analysis was published in computational uh, computational archaeology journal computational uh, application to archaeology yeah. and uh, yeah and also the other the other two works the one on the angles and on the traditional analysis uh, is all uh, is all published okay we took a lot of time yeah, uh, sorry <laughs> so uh, Xenia here you are here I am so, uh, Three dear colleagues, <laughs> let me introduce uh, you as uh, one more talk about bone tools, uh, about bone tools from Altai Middle Paralysis from Chigurskaya Cave. So, uh, 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 as you know from the talk of the Ukpeson and Malvina Bauman, we have a huge amount of tools from Chigurskaya Cave that we needed to do something with because it's several thousand and uh, what to do. <laughs> so we decided uh, to use uh, 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 3D techniques. And uh, so you know what, uh, our lab in our institute appears exactly after our visit, uh, our digital lab in our institute appears exactly after our visit to Leora's lab. So we think that Leora is our teacher and we are trying to follow her and her experience and her amazing results. So here I want you to present uh, several new results, uh, results in uh, studying of uh, bone retouchers. So, uh, so bone retouchers we studied came from Chigurskaya cave, which is located in Altai mountains. Uh, uh, the Chigurskaya cave is quite small, uh, located near the uh, river, and it is uh, 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 one of the key sites of the Sibirichika culture, and it is the easternmost mani ma manifestation of Mikokian culture. So late Neanderthals uh, uh, came uh, to Chigurskaya 
came from Central and Eastern Europe approximately 70,000 years ago. And they located the Valtea only two caves. So now more, but uh, so we, we have more evidence of their appearance in, in Altai Mountains, but now it's published only about two sites. So Chigirskaya cave is uh, one of the key sites. And uh, so during the excavation, we recognize that we have a huge amount of bone tools. Uh, so excavating the um, one in situ layer, we can uh, find many uh, bone tools, retouchers and so on. Uh, so uh, in uh, Pug uh, report, uh, he uh, describes the different types, such as rounded point tips, uh, uh, like scrapers, lustrage, and uh, intermediate tools. But we have uh, uh, almost more than 1,200 1, of bone retouchers, and now is even more. So we began to scan it, and we began with the most uh, simple, with the simplest methods uh, to. Uh, study the bone retouchers. We were trying to study the active area of bone retouchers, measuring the angles and so on. And also we applied uh, the simple metrical parameter. So, and actually uh, when we was uh, trying to do it, we didn't find any significant difference in between different types of the retoucher with one uh, active area, two active area. Uh, we didn't find any difference uh, in between retouchers uh, with a different degree of utilization and so on. So we, and, uh, we will talk about it later. Uh, what we find uh, so we compared the metrical parameter in between uh, different uh, uh, sites, which is belong to one cultural tradition like Mikokian and to different uh, cultural tradition like Denisovan with uh, uh, Lula, Mosteria and Middle Paleolithic of Paltai. And we find that almost all uh, uh, retouchers that have been de described as a complete retouchers has the same uh, proportions. So we think that here we meet with uh, quite, uh, um, exactly functional and characteristic of retouchers, which is common uh, at, at least for the middle polarity retouchers, which is common for the different uh, sites and different parts of the world. And it is uh, belonging to the um, earliest types of the humans. Uh, so uh, our next step was uh, applying of the scar pattern analysis, trying to uh, investigate uh, um, the traces uh, of the uh, uh, intentional modification of the retoucher. Uh, usually retouchers uh, are uh, believed, to, uh, are thought to be as a, uh, um, uh, how situation tools and uh, uh, flakes for the retouchers uh, used to be uh, uh, situa situational and taken from the floor, for example. And uh, uh, our um, studies uh, have shown that it is not that kind of simple tools and it was uh, modificated, modificated in length and width. And uh, so we compared uh, the um, uh, retouchers uh, and retouchers made uh, during the experiments. So, and uh, uh, we've got uh, stati statistically significant difference in between uh, uh, retouchers, uh, uh, archaeological retouchers uh, uh, exper and experimental retouchers and, uh, uh, and bone blanks obtaining during the batch run. So usually bone blanks obtaining during the batch runs is longer and wider. So uh, we think that, uh, uh, that uh, the production of the retouchers was uh, quite, um, uh, so it was a, a one technological sequence uh, when the blanks uh, became shorter and uh, uh, less wider. So, and it is making retouchers, uh, at least from Chigurska cave in general, uh, like formal tools uh, instead of informal. So what we did else, we applied the uh, geometric morphometric 3D analysis using uh, Gadi and uh, Leora's uh, software. And uh, so, uh, uh, first of all, we recognized that even for such uh, uh, tools with not regular shape, uh, the geometric morphometric uh, analysis is uh, possible to apply. And the second one, we recognize that the anatomical position of the uh, blank of the retoucher does not, uh, has not 
uh, effect of uh, to the shape uh, to the shape of the blank. It means that the selectivity of the Neanderthals in of uh, blank uh, retoucher was so high that uh, anatomical position didn't influence it. So it and it is one small uh, evidence uh, for the. Uh, I would say quite uh, uh, complicated technological sequence of the preparing and selectivity of the bone retouchers. And uh, when we uh, was trying to apply our techniques, uh, we performed the experiments. And during the experiments, uh, our uh, uh, high level uh, experimenter, he, uh, he told uh, an idea. He told an idea that the uh, shape uh, of the active area of the retouchers is re influenced by the way of gripping of the retoucher. So uh, we choose the two, uh, two uh, from our point of view, most common and the most uh, useful uh, type of the gripping. It's uh, A, uh, it's a gripping with the three fingers and B is a gripping with the uh, arm, with the all fingers of the arm, of the hand. So, and we uh, perform the experiments using this attribute. So, and what did we get? Um, uh, here, I'm I will try to show the video of the using of the retoucher. Here is by uh, the experimenter use all fingers of the hand. And uh, the next one, uh, the experimenter is using three fingers. So here you, you can see the difference in the gripping type of the retoucher. So, uh, and the difference is that uh, when you use uh, three fingers, uh, you use only muscles from the, uh, from the arm. And uh, when you use uh, uh, all fingers of your hand, you use uh, 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 so at least uh, almost uh, all muscles of your uh, hand, complete hand, <laughs> I mean. So uh, we produced a, a series of the experimental retouchers. Uh, so here you can see retouchers A was produced using uh, uh, all fingers. And the uh, retouchers uh, uh, B uh, uh, have been produced using three fingers, uh, gripping with three fingers. So even here you can see that uh, uh, when you use all fingers, that the active area of the retoucher is bigger, at least bigger. So and after after. Uh, that uh, we performed uh, quite simple calculations. Uh, first of all, we uh, calculated the area of the uh, of the uh, the area of the active area. Sorry, <laughs> and uh, after it, uh, we fill the active area to recognize the initial uh, volume of the blank of the of the bone retouchers. And after, so we the difference in between volume uh, of the blank uh, with field active area and in between uh, uh, retoucher with not field active area will be the volume of the removed bone during the retouching of the bone retoucher. So we used uh, only two parameters to recognize the difference in between uh, 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 to uh, trying to recognize uh, the difference uh, of uh, way of gripping the retoucher. Uh, so here we was trying to uh, understand uh, how uh, the uh, gripping way influence uh, the uh, area of the active area of the retoucher. So, and here you can see that uh, if you use all fingers, the active area is bigger, significantly bigger than uh, active area on the retouchers if you use only three fingers. Uh, to compare it, uh, we also check uh, the degree of utilization. So, and uh, to recognize the degree of utilization, we uh, count uh, the quantity of the edges that have been 
um, retouched by the, by the exact experimental retoucher. So, and uh, here we have uh, three degree of sterilization, one uh, weak degree. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it, it means uh, that uh, the retoucher uh, have been used to, to uh, produced only one age on the stone tool, medium degree two ages, and strong degree three and more ages, including um, bifacial uh, production. So here we can see that degree of fertilization doesn't influence uh, the uh, uh, area uh, or uh, the active area of the retouchers uh, much less than uh, the gripping way. Um, so, and next one, next one, we uh, calculated the volume of the removed bone from the bone retouchers, and we've got almost the same uh, results uh, when, uh, if you use all fingers uh, retouching the, uh, the stone tools, uh, so the volume of the remo uh, remove, uh, removed bone will be much bigger if, uh, uh, if in, in the case uh, of using three fingers. And once more, if you will apply the attribute of the utilization degree, we will see that it doesn't influence uh, the uh, active zone of the retoucher in such way as a gripping method. Uh, so after it, uh, so we uh, uh, was trying to compare our archaeological retouchers and uh, our experimental retoucher using these two variables. So here you can see that we have quite small areas and quite big areas of the active zone. So every active zone was calculated separately. And uh, what did we find here? So here we find uh, that uh, the most of archaeological retouchers uh, it's a stars, uh, so um, was obtained mostly using three fingers. And uh, uh, so here is a violet uh, area is uh, 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 gripping by all fingers and uh, uh, gray area is a gripping of the retouchers by uh, three fingers. So the most of the archeological retouchers have been obtained, uh, looks like it have been obtained using three fingers and uh, so, uh, uh, so, because the active area, the most of the active area of the archaeological retouchers is quite small. So, but uh, some of the active area uh, of the archaeological retouchers is quite big, you can see here. So, of course, we have here that kind of limit area when you, you will not recognize if, if, if it had been used. Uh, by uh, three fingers or five fingers, but uh, in any case, uh, that kind of uh, very small and very big area quite recognizable. Uh, so what did we? Uh, so we began to think what was the reason to use three or five fingers, and uh, also we was trying to detect uh, the direction uh, of the. Uh, long stretched, uh, uh, long bits on the uh, experimental and archaeological uh, uh, retouchers. And we recognize that uh, 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 the retouchers uh, obtained by three, uh, by gripping uh, by three finger, with three fingers. Uh, so the long uh, bits uh, have uh, uh, the direction that more parallel than the retouchers using by all fingers. So it looks like that uh, uh, it is. Uh, uh, it was optional. It depends because it uh, that Neanderthal had. Uh, for example, if you want to rejuvenate uh, um, uh, the edge of the bifaces or of the scraper, you can. Um, it, it's easier for you to use three finger, and uh, so it means uh, that all of the long bits will be more or less parallel. But if you want to do something different, if you want uh, to not to rejuvenate or to produce or to produce the new uh, scraper or bifaces. If you want to produce the, the tip on the bifaces or scraper or on the point. So you need uh, uh, more, how to say, more variable uh, movement of, of, of your hand. So, and uh, that means, uh, uh, and also you need uh, more uh, uh, to, to, to put more force uh, 
uh, uh, in uh, the treated uh, uh, lysic tools. So it means that if you use all fingers, uh, so, so the uh, long, uh, long uh, pits will be less parallel. So, but uh, it needs uh, to be investigated more that aims uh, and uh, how it was used. But uh, up to now, we, we can see that uh, uh, retouchers is not so simple, and so the uh, uh, technology of the reduction product, uh, retoucher production, and using using retouchers is uh, quite complicated, and it was very very variable. Uh, the fact is that in uh, Chigurskaya cave, uh, the most of the retouchers have been produced with three fingers. Uh, it uh, um, meet uh, the data on. Um, uh, the anatomical, um, uh, how to say, uh, uh, of the anatomical skills of the Neanderthals that they uh, that they could uh, produce very very tiny and very very uh, small pieces uh, uh, using only several fingers. And also, uh, as we have more uh, retouchers produced uh, by three fingers using three fingers, also we can. Uh, conclude that mostly at Chigurskaya caves, uh, the retoucher have been used to, to rejuvenate the tools and then to produce it. So all the tools uh, that, uh, could be delivered uh, to the cave or produced in the cave uh, has quite long uh, story, long life story when it had been rejuvenated for several times. So here we made the data uh, from archaeology when we have around 20% of the bifacial sinning stakes uh, in the assemblage of the recognizable bifacial sinning stakes. And it is the only, how to say, top of the iceberg because uh, uh, the recognizable bifacial sinus flakes, uh, it came only from the last stages of the production of the bifaces or bifacial, uh, bifacial rejuvenation. Also not only bifacial, but also scrapers as well. Uh, so here we recognize uh, that the grip method of the gripping of the retoucher uh, influence the active area of the retouchers in uh, 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 in more degree uh, than the uh, utilization, uh, the, uh, than the uh, mode of the utilization. And we think uh, that it's uh, one of the most influenced, uh, influenced factor in formation of the uh, middle polarisic retoucher. Using such uh, simple uh, variables as uh, area, of, uh, as active area and uh, and uh, the volume of the removed bones, I think that every researcher can apply that method uh, to the retoucher they have. Also, I think it will be also possible to make uh, with uh, lysic to uh, 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 with the retouchers made on lysics on the bulbs, for example, like at Nasharamla, for, uh, for example. So, and that's it. I wanted to tell you, and thanks for your attention. Oh, thank you, Xenia, for this uh, so interesting uh, talk. Uh, are there any questions? I have a question. I have uh, uh, maybe two. One is probably trivial for you, but I tried now while you were talking to hold something in three fingers. Could you show me how it goes? What's the difference between three and five? So three yeah. fingers. So if it is a retoucher, so you will use it like three fingers and you will retouch in this way. So um, in this part of the of uh, um, of your arm, it, uh, it, the hand is, is very, very flexible. Mm -hmm. So and it's very useful to, for the rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. And if you use the uh, uh, all fingers of your hand, so it means uh, here your hand ah, is not so good. flexible. So it means if you use all the fingers of the hand, uh, you automatically uh, will um, uh, uh, so will produce the strikes with more force. Is then using three fingers, so and yeah, that is, it is so re recognizable. And uh, a second question that I have: uh, How did you uh, calculate the um, 
the active area, the active volume? Uh, so Meaning, did you did you mark it and extract the surface? How did you do that? Uh, so we uh, color it and uh, we measure the uh, area in uh, geometric and graph. So it, it, it ah. was quite simple, but we I did see. it uh, non, uh, by digit, uh, by <laughs> manually. I see. Thank you. Any other questions? I also have a question, uh, mm -hmm. methodological. How did you measure the, the second parameter, the, the amount of volume uh, removed? Yeah, so we feel, uh, so uh, um, I can try to show. So is it visible my screen still? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, just a second. Uh, so it's, it's here. So we feel uh, all the, how to say, retouching marks on the surface of the retoucher. So it means that uh, we obtain uh, the initial volume of the uh, retoucher plan before using. After that, we measure the volume in geometric graph once more. And uh, from this volume, we uh, compare with the volume uh, with the initial blank uh, of uh, with the initial retoucher. Okay, so, thank and you. I got it. Yeah, and dif so it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. And the difference between volume and volume is the uh, volume of the removed bone. So uh, it is impossible to do without 3D technologies, but it is very very simple, and it is um, possible to apply by everybody, I think. And also, as far as we have only two variables, uh, so we don't need complicated statistics, nothing. Um, so it is also could be useful for for the wide range of the researchers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ksenia. Thank you. Wow. Okay, so uh, uh, our last talk today is by Ravil. Um, I hope I will say the name right, the Danov. 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 <laughs> uh, we'll talk about uh, Laika TS for archaeology. Uh, the floor yes. is yours. So, uh, let me start. So, uh, as you all know, uh, our station is, is an uh, irreplaceable thing in, in archaeology field uh, research. It, it's uh, used for uh, topological mapping, for uh, fixing uh, excavations, and, and so on. Uh, of course, it can be used as this, but it's much more useful to use some kind of remote control system. In our case, we use, usually use a, a, a Trimble Nomad with EDM uh, mobile software that is connected with Lego total station. Of course, this combination, combination is works well, but this uh, software is pretty old. And of course, Windows Mobile uh, operation system is pretty old too. Uh, the last uh, version has been released more than 11 years ago and because of that all tablets become very old and it's very hard to repair it or replace in case of some kind of troubles or breaks and not and also the software itself, itself built on the old style of paradigm that used mostly, I mean, it's not uh, touch friendly as most modern uh, mobile phones or modern uh, tablets. Uh, because of that, we decided to build some kind of new uh, software uh, to, uh, to to con to control and to measure using total station. And what kind of software or, or system it should be? First of all, it should be, uh, of course, user-friendly because if it's easy to use, you can uh, 
you're happy to use it, of course. Uh, you make less mistakes, and that is, it is very important too. Also, the system itself should be easily expandable or upgradable for, to, for example, to, to connect to another type of local station to do something new uh, uh, if you require to, to change that, something. And of course, it should be built on uh, not unique co components. But I mean, if you, for example, find some kind of uh, tablet with uh, unique ports or, or something like this, you cannot be, it cannot be upgraded or replaced in future because uh, unique products are um, very hard to think if they get discounted. Well, and we, because of these requirements, we decided to split the system uh, into the two parts. The first part uh, is um, Android powered smartphone or, 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 or tablet, it's, it doesn't matter. That, that do all the things. I mean, it pro pro processes all data, it's, it, it is keeping all data you need or, and, and save uh, and also how to edit everything. And another uh, part that connected to the total station itself. Uh, um, and from a user point of view, it's just extension for, for total station that allow it to transmit or, or measure data from total station to, to his de device. And because it is modern time, we, dis we decided that Wi-Fi connection or Bluetooth connection should be uh, fine but we stopped on Wi-Fi uh, connection. Uh, because uh, of this splitting into the two systems, uh, we have many benefits. First of all, there is almost no requirement for smartphone or tablet because you can buy almost everything. And maybe the only requirement is uh, the display should be large enough uh, because it's much easier to use, probably. It maybe it depends on on person. Also, freedom of movement, of movement, you can go away from the station and check and check something. Probably it's okay. And also, it, mm, because of this separation of functions, uh, the adaptive safe, it may be built as a very simple device that only transmit data from one device to another device. So, and what we got? Uh, first of all, let me show uh, this device itself. So we, we decided to make uh, this, this device on, uh, yes, it's system on chip uh, microcontroller uh, that is the black uh, board uh, on this uh, picture. Uh, uh, this, this microcontroller has a uh, very powerful chip on it and can handle almost every task. And also uh, it has built-in Wi-Fi adapter and you almost need not something additional. Uh, also, uh, it connected on the same way as, as, as triple NAMAT to, to make a total station. And also it has a built-in uh, pretty large battery that allows to uh, function for a few days. If we didn't check how exact, how how long exactly it could be uh, used, but anyway, for one day it's pretty enough. And also, everything is wrapped into the plexiglass case that are pretty thick and and robust. It's very important on transportation and on on using because it, uh, everything could be fall down. <laughs> so and. Uh, once again, once again about Android device, because there are high uh, variety of available devices uh, in the market, you can choose everything and else you can use your own uh, smartphone if you want to. And uh, because almost all modern uh, smartphones and tablets are pretty, uh, have, have pretty good processor inside, it can do almost all 
post-processing you can imagine. And we, uh, after uh, finishing prototype of our software, the, the minimum requirement uh, that we got is uh, Wi-Fi and Android version 5.0 that released in 2014. So it is more than seven years ago. So almost every phone or tablet you buy now will be on up. So about software itself. Uh, the uh, overall uh, interface is, is inspired by uh, the mobile software, but with uh, many modifications because it is on, uh, on larger screen and it has many additional uh, features. So uh, first of all, um, what we made. Uh, it is possible to, uh, graphic, to gra graphically represent all excavations uh, not now we um, implemented only top view uh, this, uh, this possibility to um, to filter all measurement by prefix I uh, prefix is something that used to distinguish all uh, different type of measurements for example excavations could be uh, one prefix for example uh, some kind of topographical marks is another prefix. Some kind of mm, addition, something additional you find could be something uh, could be a third prefix. Also, the filter for uh, uh, layer and 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 sub layer is uh, is presented too. As you can export it to an image in into an image if you want to. As of course you can. Uh, just uh, show all of all points as as as, as simply. Also, uh, every point, if something went wrong, you you made a mistake, can be easily uh, uh, modified. Uh, also, there is possibility to um, mask point anything. I I mean, if you uh, me me uh, measure few points with wrong layer, you can select all these points and change uh, mm, layer for all these points in, in, in one click. Also, it is easy to ma manage uh, as many side, uh, side as you want to. Uh, so because everything saves separately, also, it may be not very important, but, but still could be useful. Uh, you can set up a total station uh, from as many points as you want to. Of course, uh, in general case, two points are pretty enough, but in case you want to achieve higher accuracy, you can uh, measure um, uh, three, four, five, or even more reference points to determine your own uh, position. And also, it can be used in case of a wrong placement on of, of, of the total station. Uh, because uh, um, setting up of horizontal level is, is very important in, in measurement, but uh, this mistake, but not all total stations are fixed this for, for you in case of small mm, 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 mis setup. In this case, uh, measuring uh, three or more reference points can fix this uh, for, uh, inside this uh, application. This feature is not tested yet, but it is you know, possible to, to check it. Uh, also, all reference points uh, are easy to m manage too, and maybe not the, not the last feature. The the export of all data is very uh, is is implemented just in one click, unlike in 
the mobile software where it is very mm, complex and many step process and it takes uh, a lot of time as I, as I remember. And probably this, there is something else I don't mention because I don't know why. So uh, this software is, uh, um, uh, in combination with adapter has been tested in two sizes this summer and autumn. First of all, it was a uh, Chagirsky case, and the second side is Axonas in Kazakhstan. Uh, so, this is the most valuable uh, data has been obtained, of course, from Chagirsky case uh, because it uh, was at, at summer, and m m many different. Um, Fixes and, and feature has been implemented during this this field test, and it, as I remember, it's more than fifty or even sixty different fixes has been made uh, uh, during during this time, and then in Axnat, almost um, all features have been implement, implemented. We wanted to and it was some kind of final test that was, uh, I think, successful. And in, in comparison with uh, Chagirska case, where everything is, is, is everything is, is close to the total station and to each other. Uh, in 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 uh, case, you tell the, uh, the, the data uh, obtained using this uh, software was used to build a topographical map. Uh, I mean, it's some kind of life scale test for, for this software. And it was successful too, as I said. And um, as as means, we, yes, we, we created new and easy to use complex for Lake total stations that it lays easily available parts. And of course it works. Or, and all field tests gave uh, our um, was, uh, valuable data for improvements, and most of them have been implemented, as I said. Uh, also, we are planning to do some additional um, improvement. Uh, first of all, it, it is adapter because the, um, the adapter I showed to you is some kind of prototype. It, it has been uh, uh, built up from, from different parts. It works, but it could be uh, some uh, smaller and more robust because the, um, in now state, it may be not as good as it could be. Also, it's possible to adapt this application itself to for, for nickel total stations because they allow to connect to allow to remove control too. And in institutes that are numerous of, of them and it is I think it is important too and also uh, implement more elaborated uh, measure point representation like uh, 3d view uh, uh, different projections because now it's only uh, from top to down view and maybe something else also some small fixes that um, not very important but but still also we are going to make this uh, software and complex uh, public soon when we finish all uh, initial preparation and, and, and test. So probably that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, this is uh, good news. I will contact you before the excavation. Uh, my question <laughs> okay. is, my question yeah. is, uh, so it's only with Leica, right? Uh, right now, yes, because uh, we tested on, on Leica, but it looks like many different uh, total stations have a similar protocol for remote control. And we hope it can be used for another type of total station. Uh, anyone has a question? Mm -hmm. 
Mm, I want to tell you a small remark about uh, practical usage of mm. that uh, <laughs> software and uh, device, <laughs> Wi-Fi device for the Leica. So it's very, very convenient and very, very, and so easy because now you are not connected to the total station. You don't need to stay near. You, you don't need nothing. You need only student with uh, total station and everything else. You, you can roll with a student total station and uh, application on your tab. So now you are not. You don't depend on total station on cables on nothing because before it we use uh, uh, EDM mobile on Namat. Uh, on Trimble Namat, and I was always worried what will happen with that uh, mother cable from Namat to Total Station because it's impossible to buy in Russia and it will be broken and blah, blah. And now you can use tap, you can use your phone, you can use everything. So, and finally, I think that uh, this software will be something uh, in between or connecting uh, either mobile uh, that's it. Uh, so previously it was really, really good and uh, uh, really widespread among all archaeologists in the world and new desk, I think, with that 3D projection, 2D projections, and uh, so you can control your excavation during the field work. And then thank you, uh, Ravil, <laughs> for, for, for the device because it makes our free. <laughs> Uh, I think, thank you. I think uh, also Tom Levy developed something similar, uh, but um, but uh, maybe look look it up. But uh, but uh, this is a great great help. If you if I will be able to adapt it to my total station, I will be very happy. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Xenia, this is uh, Arena. This was yeah. our last talk. Yes, this wonderful this day. day. Yes. So tomorrow we'll begin at the same time with um, next session, and um, the chairperson will be uh, Professor Malgajata Kot, and uh, it will be the session innovative versus traditional approaches. Why do we need both types of methods? And um, tomorrow we'll have a keynote session. Uh, after that and discussion. And so, uh, I want to tell, uh, thank you for everybody today. Uh, so I think that our first day of the conference was really successful. So generally we had a uh, um, 50 person, uh, persons of, uh, particip of participants who was uh, in charge in conference or who was listening us uh, in uh, Zooms and in YouTube and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, bye. -bye. bye.